Good afternoon, and at this time, will sergeants in charge of recording please start their recording? PC recording started. Thank you. PC recording to the clouds, all set. Thank you. And good afternoon, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Parks and Recreation. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you, and we are ready to begin. Chair, yeah, cool, we're ready to begin. Okay, I'm ready. You may begin with your opening, Chair. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Peter Ku, Chair of the City Council's Committee on Parks and Recreation. I would like to welcome you to our virtual hearing that will examine the state of historic houses under Parks Department of Jurisdiction. Historic houses are hidden cultural treasures of our city. There are 23 of them located in each of the five boroughs. They include a variety of structures ranging from farmers' cottages to former homes of prominent New Yorkers to grand mansions, including Gracie Mansion. According to recent data, they attract over 750,000 visitors each year, including 480,000 of the city's students. The majority of the historic houses are New York City's landmarks, and a few are on National Register of Historic Places. The Parks Department and historic houses will go into a little more detail on the operation issues. But to put it uh, briefly, each house is owned by the city and operated by separate nonprofit entities with help from the Historic House Trust. The trust was created in 1989 to help the past department maintain and preserve the various housing, uh, the, the various historic houses. The trust oversees the care and operation of the houses and coordinates activities between DPR and the staffs of each house. While DPR provides some funding for the trust, including office space, the trust and each historic house mostly re rely on private donations for their basic operations. It has been a while since the committee conducted oversight into how historic houses are failing. So I thought this was a good time to hold this hearing, especially in light of how COVID-19 has affected their operations. Specifically, I'm curious about the role paid by the past department and historic houses trust in how they work and interact with the individual historic houses when it, comes, when it comes to maintenance, security, and event planning. Whether they provide enough and substantive assistance to each historic house, and whether there's a need to reform any part of the procedures that govern how historic houses are funded, maintained, and operated. I'm concerned with reports that have indicated Some houses have had major issues with performing basic and necessary maintenance and repair work and have had issues with, re with receiving assistance for cleanup related to damage caused by severe weather. 
such as tropical storm Isaias. In addition, I hope this hearing will examine how DPR's recent budget and staff cuts for fiscal 2021 will impact the future of historic houses and how COVID-19, which has forced which has forced the temporary closing of the houses will impact the ability of these museums to safely operate and continue to serve the cultural and historic needs of the city. Thank you all and welcome. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy uh, this committee is joined by council member Adams, Cohen and Holden. I will now turn it over to moderator, committee counsel, Chris Satori to go over some procedure items. Thank you, Chair Ku. I'm Chris Sartori, senior counsel to the committee on parks and recreation, and I will be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you'll be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I'll be calling on various panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called as I will be periodically announcing who will be testifying next. We will first be hearing testimony from the administration followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We'll be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer those questions. For members of the public who will testify, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any, once it's your time to speak. We'll now be calling representatives of the administration to testify. We will be hearing testimony from Sam Biederman, Assistant Commissioner of the Department of Parks and Recreation, and John Krawchuk, Director of the Historic House Trust. Matt Jury, Director of Government Relations at the Parks Department, will also be present to answer any questions as well. At this time, I will administer the affirmation to each representative of the administration. Um, I will call on you individually for response. So please, uh, at this point, raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond to council member questions honestly? Commissioner Biederman? I do. Director Krawchuk? Do. Mr. Drury? Do. Thank you. At this time, I will invite Assistant Commissioner Biederman and Director Krawchuk to present their testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and good afternoon, Chair Ku and members of the City Council Parks Committee. Uh, my name is Sam Biederman. I'm Assistant Commissioner for Community Outreach and Partnership Development at the Parks Department. I'm excited today to discuss one of our most cherished, par cherished partners, the Historic House Trust. Founded over 30 years ago in 1989 with roughly 15 properties with the purpose of providing specialty resources for the cultural artifacts that exist on parkland, the HHT advocates for, promotes, and provides expertise to preserve now 23 publicly owned historic sites located throughout the city's five boroughs. These are houses that have seen difficult times, wars, economic depressions, and yes, pandemics. And they tell the story of this city's unique talent for renewal and reinvention. The HHT and its partner houses provide an extraordinary opportunity for visitors to experience history in a fun and tangible way. And now in light of COVID, they provide an opportunity to discover over 360 years of New York City history from home. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the executive director of the Historic House Trust, John Krawchuk. Thank you, Commissioner Biederman uh, for the wonderful introduction to our houses um, and good afternoon, Chair Ku and members of the City Council Parks Committee. Uh, my name is John Krawchuk and I have served as the executive director of the Historic House Trust of New York City for the past four and a half years. In my comments today, I plan to touch on several topics first an introduction to HHT, then the role of NYC Parks with our houses, and then that of our nonprofit house partners who operate the sites. 
And lastly, I would like to share with you updates on how the pandemic is affecting our house museums. By way of introduction, the Historic House Trust is a 501c3 nonprofit organization presently consisting of seven staff members. Three of them are parks employees, including myself, and four are privately paid. We have 27 volunteer board members and an advocacy group called the Directors Council that support our mission. We work in partnership with NYC Parks to preserve, promote, and provide expertise to 23 publicly owned historic sites in all five boroughs. We accomplish this work mainly through the oversight of maintenance and operations, as well as capital projects and managing license agreements between NYC Parks and the house partners. The houses, as we like to call the sites collectively, mostly consist of individual domestic dwellings representing modest farmhouses to grand mansions and a lighthouse, a working farm, uh, a village, and a schoolhouse that presently operates as a marionette theater. Two of our sites host multiple buildings with lar within larger parks, historic Richmond Town and the Queens County Farm Museum. Collectively, the houses span over 360 years of our city's history. The earliest home dating to 1652, the Wyckoff Farmhouse, and the most recent to 1933, a restoration and reconstruction of the Old Stone House. Both are located in Brooklyn. And I might add that the Wyckoff Farmhouse happens to be the oldest structure in New York City. Our house museums are important physical reminders of New York City's rich and long history and are architecturally and culturally significant resources. The house sites are owned by the public, open to all, and are operated by committed nonprofit partners who hire their own staff and raise their own private dollars to provide essential programming and events. They also have volunteer boards who work tirelessly along the side of the house directors to fund their house activities and bring hands-on history to the public. Our house partners work jointly with NYC Parks and HHT to carry out this preservation mission through city license agreements and to serve their neighborhoods and the general public. They are instrumental in creating appealing amenities and engaging programs and a distinct sense of place for their surrounding parks and communities. And they thrive as cultural centers, attracting more than 800,000 visitors annually in a normal year nearly a third of whom are local school children. Our sites engage the public through placemaking programming that addresses inclusivity, universal accessibility, ecology, horticulture, history, and the arts and sciences. All of this requires a network of support to maintain aging buildings and sites and to operate time intensive programming. We accomplish this by way of the license agreements that specify the roles and responsibilities of NYC Parks, HHT, and the house partners. I would now like to introduce you to our specialty sectors of work, starting with capital projects. We are very grateful to you, our devoted city council members, the borough presidents, and the mayor for the significant funding that you allocate to restore and improve our historic buildings and our sites. Presently, our houses have 26 planned individual capital projects secured with $70 million of allocated city funds. Design and construction restoration projects are managed in three ways, either directly by HHT through a sole source agreement that we have with the city or with the assistance from project managers at either NYC Parks Capital Division or the Department of Design and Construction, also known as DDC. Maintenance and operations is another important aspect of service that HHT oversees at our sites. We have dedicated NYC Park staff to manage maintenance and operations requests and city contracts for certain services. On average, the city expends about $400,000 a year on maintenance at our sites, consisting of service contracts, emergency repairs, and utilities. HHT also provides curatorial support to assist the houses and collections that are on display 
and stored at the houses that are used for public interpretation and educational programs. Our curator has provided cataloging services, interior environmental monitoring for the well being of objects, and the deployment of a team of curatorial HHT volunteers known as the Roof Raisers, who help with specialty housekeeping for fragile antique objects and interior spaces. The program is quite popular and a great engagement tool that allows for special access and interaction for our volunteers with tangible history and objects while accomplishing important maintenance goals. Presently, nine of our 23 houses are open for interior tours with COVID compliant guidelines in effect. The remaining houses have not been able to open either related to interior space restrictions or due to the lack of staff members or docents to lead small group tours or monitor self-guided tours. I would now like to share with you some comparison attendance figures pre and post pandemic. As part of HHT's role in managing license agreements, we gather attendance records from the houses that are incorporated into the mayoral management report twice a year. The houses report attendance in three separate categories, general admission, schools and groups, and events and programs. On average for calendar year 19 and calendar year 20, general admission accounted for 25% of all visitation schools and groups another 25%, and events and programs 50% of all visitation. The historic houses have seen a drastic reduction of in-person visitation because of the pandemic. From mid-March to late July, our museums were not permitted to be open to the general public, resulting in an estimated loss of 260,000 visitors compared to the previous calendar year. In total, between March 2019 and October of 2019, the historic houses saw attendance of 595,000 visitors versus the current figures from March of 2020 to October of 2020, when we saw only 3,143 visitors, less than 1% of the previous calendar year's attendance. To make up for that lack of in-person attendance during the per this period, many of our historic house partners have offered dynamic virtual programming and are using this technology to keep their audiences engaged. In addition to the staff members that are city employees, HHT also has four employees who are funded through our private fundraising efforts. This team manages our office environment, fundraising and grant writing, HHT's programming and social media communications outreach to promote the houses collectively, sharing news and programs that are offered to the public. One exciting example is a program that HHT is now um, managing, which is enhances accessibility for uh, our houses to people with dis disabilities through innovative programming and services to our houses. The two-year project will update NYC Park's Accessible Transition Plan at all of our house sites and fund five pilot projects to bring, um, to bring the um, special innovation to our house sites and improve the museum experience for all people with disabilities and all visitors. While HHT's private fundraising is largely expended on staff salaries and benefits to support the important work that occurs at our sites, we realize the need to assist our house partners with unrestricted grants when possible for critical needs on site. These funds, while modest compared to their adopted budgets, do help provide relief and supplement their own fundraising efforts, particularly during the current crisis. The budgets for our house partners are largely dependent on visitation from school groups and support from the city in the form of DCLA and NYC Parks grants generously, generously out allocated by the city council and the borough president's offices. At several of our sites, this funding source is over 50% of their annual revenue. You will recognize some of the programs that are so beneficial to our visitors. Cultural After Schools Adventure Program, also known as CASA, SUCASA, its companion, the Cultural Immigrant Initiative, and the Coalition of Theaters of Color. 
We thank you for supporting this important work and ensuring that whenever possible during this particularly challenging time, that the city's budget recognizes the critical role of culture and parks that are the lifeblood of our local communities. As we are all aware, the city is facing unprecedented fiscal challenges. Budget impacts have been felt by every corner of our city agency, including parks and the historic houses in our portfolio. We are dedicated to working with our partners to advance their programs and keep their houses operating and provide key support for capital projects and maintenance. While we are committed to ensuring the success of our houses, HHT's staff resources are finite, so our capacity will always be limited to some degree. Our houses have stood the test of time, anchoring our most cherished park spaces and neighborhoods throughout the city. I feel confident that together we will see them through this rough patch and beyond. Visitors will be welcomed back and hands-on history will rebound to serve current and future generations of New Yorkers. Thank you for all of your continued support of historic houses and for starting such an important dialogue with this hearing today. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I will turn it over to Council Member Ku, who will ask his questions. Thank you. Before I ask questions, uh, I want to say uh, we are joined by Council Member Levine and Council Member Jonai. So, Director John Quattro uh, and uh, Commissioner Biderman, thank you for coming to testify. Uh, my first question is, how many historic houses are landmark? Of those that are, of those that are not, why is it the case and that they have not yet been landmark? So I, I can, uh, I think I'm unmuted. Yes, um, again, John Krachuk, Director of Historic House Trust. Um, I'm happy to answer that, that question, Chair Ku. Um, all of our houses actually have um, landmark, local landmark designation with the exception of the Old Stone House. Uh, but that has a national register listing. And so um, at the state and the national level, it does have, um, it is identified as a landmark property. Uh, so are there any houses currently going through the landmarking process? There's one, right? No? Uh, not presently, no. No. Okay, thank you. So what financial assistance is provided for historic houses by past department and, it can, and historic house trusts? Uh, what are the dollar amounts for fiscal 20 and 21? So um, I can answer that, those questions. Again, John Krachuk. Um, so the, there, there isn't direct assistance provided to the nonprofits that have the license agreements by the city with the exception of discretionary funds that are provided by council members or the borough president. Um, the parks department and HHT advocate on behalf of the house sites for uh, capital projects along with our house partners. And so that is one aspect of funding um, the uh, repair and restoration of both the structures on the sites as well as the house. Um, expense dollars, which are um, uh, typically spent on maintenance and operations, um, we have a small budget each year that is assigned specifically to the Historic House Trust for service contracts, but then we also receive um, incredible support and backing from each of the borough shops. Uh, and the way that that is structured is that each borough has its own maintenance and operations shop, which services that borough. Um, and they service everything from park sites to recreation centers, um, uh, as well as any park structure or site, uh, in addition to our historic houses. And so when I quoted the figure of $400,000 a year that is expended for the maintenance of the houses, um, that includes the labor and materials that the borough shops spend each year um, at each site throughout the five boroughs. Thank you. Uh, we are also joined by council member Wen Bremer. So uh, are the funds raised by the HHT they are typically donated to the houses each year uh, around $2,500. 
uh, required to be used for spe specific purpose, or are they just for general use? Those are unrestricted grants that the Historic House Trust has provided to our houses for a period of years now. So uh, to answer your question, unrestricted means that there is absolutely no requirement for the, the funds to be spent for any specific purpose. Um, our houses are free to use them as they see fit. Um, and, uh, and we don't require um, uh, any sort of uh, reporting back on how the funds are spent either. Uh, the funds are provided to them on a yearly basis in general uh, and, uh, and are always contingent upon our own ability to fundraise each year um, through our own um, fundraising events that we do throughout the year and through the fundraising activities of our volunteer board. Thank you. So how much does HHT provide to the license uh, to the license each year without labor and materials. Uh, Cherku, are you referring to um, to funding? Yeah. How how much does do you provide funding for uh, each individual license um, house? Uh. So for the for the um, the unrestricted grants that are provided, it's the twenty five hundred dollars per site that you uh, you just referenced, um, yeah. and then for maintenance and operations, there's not a set figure um, for the houses, with the exception of service contracts. Uh, service contracts are set contracts that the city has with vendors, and those are typically provided for extermination services and uh, fire suppression and detection systems. And those are typically allocated per site, depending on how big the house is. Um, and that is a set figure as part of the contract service um, that is provided to, to each individual house. Okay. So the 400,000 uh, you mentioned is in, inclusive of labor, materials and labor, right? Correct. So about a um, hundred, a little over um, around $120,000 a year is what is spent throughout the five boroughs collectively for labor and materials um, for work that happens at our house sites. So out of the $400,000 uh, budget, um, the houses only get 2,500 directly. So if I could just clarify um, the, the difference between those funding sources, um, the $2,500 is not city, city raised money. That is money that is privately raised by, um, by the Historic House Trust through our volunteer board, um, as well as through our own uh, fundraising efforts in-house with our Director of External Affairs who provides uh, uh, our support for funding. So I guess it would be similar to maybe the Central Park Conservancy. Um, you know, they have their own development and fundraising arm where they raise private dollars for the park. And then those private dollars would then be allocated as a, as a $2,500 grant. So that's kind of similar to what we do for all 23 of our house sites. Um, of the expense funds, those are not available to pass directly through to the houses. Those are city dollars that are assigned for maintenance of, of city parks and parks resources. And so those have to be direct charges, either for services, for labor or materials. So how many of the houses use the contract? Um, almost all of them. Um, um, I believe almost all of them use the contracts for extermination services, uh, with the exception of the Little Red Lighthouse, which doesn't require extermination. Um, and um, uh, unless they choose to, uh, to pay for it privately, which sometimes the houses make the decision that they would rather go in that direction. But in general, we do service most of the houses for extermination, and we service a portion of them for fire detection and fire suppression. Uh, we are also joined by council members Eric and council member Rivera and council member Bannon. So the next question is, uh, Director, of the funding provided by DPL each year, about $107,000, uh, is it set aside for specific purposes and is it divided up equally? Uh, uh, is it divided equally for each house? Or is it a pool of funding held by the city that each house can make use when needed? So um, so the, the 107,000 is again, expense funding that is a specific line that the parks department sets aside for our historic house sites. 
And of that, about 70,000 of that 107,000 is expended on contracts for extermination, as well as for fire suppression detection, which is the monitoring that occurs at those sites to ensure that they are safeguarded um, from fire. And so again, 70,000 is automatically spent through city contracts that have set uh, funding um, agreements with, with two service providers. Um, and then the remaining is there in case there is an emergency at one of the houses. And very often throughout the year, we will have situations that come up where um, uh, it's an unexpected um, situation that requires us to either seek um, outside vendors to come in and address the matter or to bring borough shops in to actually assist with um, with repairing um, a particular item at the house that might be a specialty item that they don't have, for instance, on stock um, in their supply shops at the individual house. So one example of that might be, let's say there is um, a, a, a clear um, plexiglass protection on the window of one of the houses that gets damaged. Um, that would be specialty materials that the shops would typically not have on hand. So in that case, the historic house trust would purchase that special protective plexiglass um, and then provide it to the borough shop to then go and install. So we would draw on that $107,000 to purchase that plexiglass. Um, if there was to be um, some other sort of critical need, um, let's say uh, some sort of hazardous materials abatement in order to do work in the house, um, and that occurred actually last year at one of our house sites where we were, um, we were fixing up the caretaker's kitchen. Um, and we discovered that there was a pipe that had some hazardous materials that had to be abated. We had to draw on that $107,000 or the remaining amount um, in order to perform that work um, and make sure that it was done correctly because our, our borough shops don't have the ability to do hazardous materials abatement. So those are kind of two examples of how that remaining, how those remaining funds, which is about $35,000 um, could be at our disposal to use at our house sites when there are things that are unexpected that come up. So they're, they're not generally available to the houses to make decisions on how they're spent. They're reserved for emergencies and unanticipated things that come up throughout the year. And with old houses, you can imagine that happens quite often. We are also joined by council members Van Bremer and council member Moyer. Thank you. So about 107,000, uh, for 23 sites, uh, seems not too much money. Now, what happens when the DPL funding runs out and the house needs uh, funding? Is that house required to raise and use private funds? Uh, if so, does HHT, your, your trust, assist them in fundraising? So the, the answer to that would be yes, um, we can assist with fundraising. Um, although uh, obviously that can be very challenging depending on, on what the need is. Uh, and there are times when our houses actually assist with maintenance and operations on occasion, maintenance and operations or with capital work. Um, but generally we really, um, you know, we really look to the city um, to help provide that support for the house sites um, so that we can really um, free up the, our house partners to do the important fundraising that they need to do in order to support their programming and event activity on site. So, um, so uh, should the money run out, we would just really, um, really circle back to the parks department and just say, would there be any ability to get a small increase in what you've allocated to us for this unanticipated emergency that has come up? Um, and it's been very rare um, that that has occurred, that the um, that the budget allocated has been um, expended in any one, one full year. Um, typically, um, the reason they come up with the 107,000 is they've realized that that's about sort of the average um, that we spent over the last several years. Um, and it typically gets us through, uh, which we're, we're very thankful for. Um, but as I had said, our, our total budget is $400,000 in maintenance and operations a year. So 107,000 of that is spent um, uh, is allocated specifically for HHT. About another 100,000 is um, what the borough shops actually provides in, in their own supplies and labor. And then the remaining 200,000 is utilities. And so that also counts towards maintenance and operations. So that brings us to the grand total of 400,000 total 
um, per year in maintenance and operations expenses. So all of the $107,000, 70,000 is slated for contracts. Correct. That means only 37,000 is spent by parts each year for all 23 houses. So by my calculation, there's only uh, $1,600 each year per house. Since well, that really actually, small money. Right, Cherku. Um, the um, the $100,000 uh, figure that I quoted, which is the labor and materials that the borough shops cover in their budgets, also applies to the 107. So it really is 207,000 uh, that is provided per year for all 23 sites. And again, 70,000 of that gets carved out for service contracts. So it brings you know the grand total down to about 137,000 a year that is spent on the 23 sites for maintenance and operations. So how much of that $107,000 is left for this year? Uh, presently, we have about 30,000 that remains. Are there instances where PASS is not able to provide funding? And then what happened then? So if, if again, the 107 that's allocated to us runs out, we would really look to the borough shops who again have a budget, um, which actually is a, also a pretty finite resource for them. Um, I think, um, you know, all of you are probably quite familiar with the, 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 the sort of the budget strains that the city is encountering um, and the challenges that we have, of course, sort of keeping up with maintenance really across the city. Um, it's, um, it's a very challenging situation. It's really no different for our houses. Um, but I have to say borough shops have always come through for us. There's never been a situation where we had to go back and say, we can't perform the work this year because there's no money. Um, and we hope that that remains the case. Um, and we've not encountered a situation where we've been told we cannot, cannot perform that. With the one exception that if, when we get close to the end of the fiscal year, if something is not a real pressing priority, we may just ask that we hold off on it until the budget is renewed um, so that we can cover it in that year. And that might be the one exception where, where we just ask if it's not something critical um, that we, we sort of um, you know, forward, forward the work on to the next fiscal year when the, when the funds have been replenished. Okay. so. How many of your staff members and how many of the uh, past departments uh, staff members are, are, are assigned, assigned to work on historic houses? Three, right? So, um, so of, the, uh, of the staff members that work directly on the uh, capital projects and the maintenance and operations, um, we presently have two that work directly with, with those. If you count me, I guess that would be three. And I do spend quite a bit of time um, overseeing and managing uh, maintenance and operations and capital projects. So that would be three, I guess, technically. Um, we presently have one vacancy for a senior architectural conservator that we're hoping that we can fill uh, just as soon as um, the city moves forward with, with hiring. And then that would really give us you know, some additional capacity to um, really sort of tackle the capital projects in particular. So um, during our September hearing uh, on the hurricane recovery, we heard that there were several outstanding fallen trees issues at various historic houses. Has PASS addressed all fallen trees and hurricane related damages since our last hearing? Have you taken care of all the problems? Yeah. The trees so, and um, the Yes, so I, I'd be happy to um, address that as well. Um, so um, all of the um, all of the most pressing um, priorities for tree removals, the ones that are going to create um, hazards to the public, have been addressed. Um, and um, I, I don't know if you've in the past had introductions to how our forestry department um, operates, um, but they have a very skilled and talented team that really um, manages, does an incredible job managing our urban forest on New York City parks. Um, and they also have very finite resources that they uh, can uh, put towards the, those, those situations, especially after uh, a major storm or a hurricane where there are a lot of down limbs that can really um, 
uh, be uh, an extreme hazard um, and also prevent appropriate usage of, of, of parks. And so they have a ranking or a rating system. And so um, at all of our house sites um, that received storm damage from trees, um, we had a pretty immediate response from the forestry team who went out and looked at those sites and then determined the level of priority. And they addressed the highest levels of priority, which were public safety related. Um, and then those that weren't necessarily related to public safety, but could be captured later, um, were kind of given a lower ranking. And so they will be addressed just as soon as possible. Um, the city is still digging out from that storm. And um, it's really months and months of work from what I understand in order to really address all of those tree, tree issues. Um, and so we're in constant touch with our house partners about the status of those trees. Um, and when we can take care of them, we absolutely will. I'm not aware of any um, issues at any of the house now that really rise to a high level of, um, of priority. Um, if there are situations with down limbs, they're on the ground safely. Um, and uh, just as soon as our forestry department can um, circle around to them, they will be um, getting to those sites and making sure um, that those limbs are removed. So how you decide whether uh, uh, something is of a pressing priority? Does the priority include does the does the priority include uh, uh, priority for trees that can completely damage uh, these uh, sand trees or houses? Oh yes. So, um, uh, 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 Chair, if I could take that one, um, I, you know, I don't, I, I'm a little um, hesitant to get into too many details about uh, how we, how the agency rates. Um, tree damage and uh, forestry items, just because uh, neither John or I are foresters. So I don't wanna, um, I don't wanna go into too much detail here yeah. lest we um, accidentally give you a uh, wrong piece of information. We're very happy to follow up with you um, regarding details on those items. But uh, I will say generally, you know, the most urgent items are you know, a tree on a roof or um, a tree blocking a street, right? Those are uh, um, uh, items that create immediate hazard or immediately get in the way of necessary movement, those come first. Does, it mean, does that mean uh, we still have older trees with limbs that are dead or, and hanging over homes? I mean, we still have some other problems. The trees Medical. over the roof, yeah. Do we still have the problem? I mean, Chris, could we? I, sorry, this is this is Matt, uh, director of government relations, and, and again, as, as Sam noted, uh, you know, I, uh, we, you know, uh, that I think we can generally characterize that by and large, any any sort of tree condition that would that would uh, relate as sort of a, a risk to either the property or to people, those have all been addressed uh, following ASIS, and that to the degree that there are any conditions uh, remaining. Uh, they are generally speaking downed limbs or, or think like tree debris, for lack of a better phrase, um, that are safely down on the ground. And in some cases, maybe, you know, cosmetically, you know, uh, might not always, you know, I can understand someone that, that remaining on our radar and it does remain on our radar. But as you, as you can understand, given our risk management approach, you know, not, 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 a, not a threat to, to life safety or to property. Uh, so generally speaking, we're not aware of any tree conditions that are threatening either one of the homes or otherwise. And if, that, and if that is the case, John and his team are obviously in close uh, contact with the homes. If that comes to our attention, we'll work with our forestry team or our borough operations team and, and make sure that that's addressed. Thank you. Uh, several of the historic homes have shared concerns about security. Are the homes prioritized for pet officers and response in case of any incidents? So I'd be happy to, um, to address that question, Chair Ku. Um, so the answer would be absolutely. Um, uh, Parks Enforcement Patrol, also known as PEP, um, is always available to assist when there is a situation at one of the houses. We also have uh, central communications at the New York City Parks Department, which addresses um, alarm breaks. And so uh, that system combined really helps us to make sure that the, the houses are secured. And on the occasion that there's an incident at the house, we have procedures in place for our house directors to um, file incident reports with us so that we can notify um, the local um, uh, enforcement um, you know, 
uh, system in place uh, at each borough or within each district so that they can be aware, especially if there's something that's ongoing or, or continuing. So does PASS and OHHT have plans to add security systems to, the, to all the historic houses? Do they have security system now or do you plan to add security system? All of the houses presently have security systems in them. Um, and, um, and some of them are monitored by the house partner uh, because the uh, arrangement um, for most of our houses is that the collections that are within the house um, are owned by the nonprofit organization that has the license agreement with the city. So we like to make sure that they, one, feel comfortable with the security systems in that is in place and two, if they feel that they would like um, to have more direct involvement with the monitoring and the oversight of, of that particular property and the collections within, um, that they have the ability to do that. But quite a number of our houses have, um, have chosen to stay with the central communications and the city provided alarm systems, um, which are, are quite effective. So has COVID-19 affected the ability to operate historic houses? Uh, has uh, Parks Department re require any safety protocols or any new protocols for historic houses to operate to the department's satisfaction? John, I'll, I'll defer to you on details with this, but um, Chair, I would note that at the very beginning of uh, the COVID crisis, uh, historic house trusts, John in particular, I want to give him credit, was um, one of our, um, all of our partners were great. They, they really were, but um, HHT to me stood out as a partner who reacted quickly and um, was very collaborative in um, coming up with ways that um, we could keep house resources online available um, while at the same time closing the houses when necessary as the crisis grew and grew. Um, so, Yes, I mean, the, the, in short, the answer to your first question is yes. I, I mean, in some very clear ways, COVID has impeded the normal operation of these houses, right? I mean, the, as uh, John noted, the majority of them are closed uh, due in part to uh, you know, the, 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 the small spaces and limited staff resources um, don't allow um, either individual guided tours or the small um, COVID safe tours that would be necessary at this time. Um, but uh, by and large, I, I have to say that HHT, from my own perspective, and I, I, I think I speak for the agency, deserves extremely high marks for um, their uh, houses themselves, for their collaborative spirit and their creativity during time. John, I, I defer to you about matters of um, details of operation. Right, I'd be happy to add to that, um, uh, Commissioner Biederman, that, um, that you know, during that, that time, uh, it was a pretty scary and unknown time, particularly at the beginning. And I think we were all trying to figure it out in, in the moment. Um, and I think it was a particular concern for our houses because of the close proximity with which our house directors and their staff interact with the public. Um, but I, I have to say it was, um, we all came together, we all figured it out. It was a wonderful spirit of collaboration um, in order to make sure that we understood that, yes, this was the right thing to do to make sure that the houses um, closed down until we knew exactly what was, was, was happening with the pandemic. And since then, as I had stated earlier in my testimony, nine of them have reopened. Um, the others aren't quite feeling comfortable with doing it at this point. Um, we're hoping at some point we can get there. Um, but, um, but all of the COVID safety guidelines are in place at our houses. And, and that goes for really all parks department uh, facilities where the public is interacting um, with staff and with other uh, volunteer members. Of the of um, and partners of the of the parks department, so um, I think we're feeling pretty good about it, and I think we've gotten some pretty positive feedback from our houses. We very early on formed a task force of all of our houses um, that was led by Victoria Monroe um, of the Alice Austin House um, uh, in concert with HHT and our other house directors to make sure that we were all communicating at the same level for the real specialty needs. Um, that our historic house museums have. As you can imagine, they're a bit different than a cultural institution like the Metropolitan Museum. 
Um, they really do require um, a different approach. Um, and I think we, we landed on that. Um, at times we're still trying to figure things out, but mostly I feel like we have a good system in place. Um, and I feel like the public who has been returning to our sites has been doing that in a really safe um, way. And um, I think they're feeling like they are re-engaging in very positive ways um, with the important work that our historic house partners do on their sites. So I, I think uh, as good as it can be during a pandemic, um, I think we're doing pretty good with, uh, with those houses that have, have reopened and feeling very good about the work um, and the safety of the public um, at those sites. Thank you. I have more questions, but at this time I want to invite other council members to ask questions. Please use your white, uh, raise hand function. Uh, Council, uh, do, do we have anyone who raised their hands? Yes, Chair Ku. Um, uh, we'll now begin with other council member questions um, and uh, we'll ask council members to ask their questions in the order uh, they have used the Zoom hand raise function. Uh, if a council member would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the raise hand function, please do so now. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and we'll let you know when your time is up. Uh, you should begin once the council member, uh, once the Sergeant at Arms has, has given you the cue. We'll now hear from Council Member Holden and he'll be followed by Council Members Cohen and Council Member Levine. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Ku. And uh, I have a question for uh, Assistant Commissioner Sam Biederman. Um, we often see that trusts associated or affiliated with the Parks Department have Parks Department employees as the directors. Um, do you consider this a conflict of interest? Uh, we, thanks for the question, um, uh, Council Member. Uh, it, I do not consider it a conflict of interest uh, because it is cleared by the Conflict of Interest Board. Um, every, uh, every individual who and there's a handful of them, as you noted, um, who has uh, what we call a joint position as um, both a park administrator, a park director, you know, it varies from title to title, and uh, leader of uh, an affiliated and licensed park nonprofit organization uh, must have that joint position uh, cleared by the Conflict of Interest Board. So an independent uh, body outside of the Parks Department uh, gives the go-ahead for those positions. Right, but that, that, that again needs to be examined because you can understand why other not-for-profits may view this uh, as a concern. Like who does uh, the director take their marching orders from? Parks uh, or should, are, are they, do they have the interests of the trust? Uh, which is, I think this needs, uh, Chair Ku, I think this needs to be looked at more because um, there can be conflicts and I don't, I had to disassociate myself as, when I became the council member from any not-for-profit or board or anything else. Uh, so it puzzles me how they, they, they tell us, they tell me that I have, to, I have to get off of organizations that I formed or organizations that I'm a member of. I can't be on the boards of this and that, but you have parks employees actually getting paid to run a not-for-profit. I can't figure that out, but that's not you know a question for you. I'll, We'll have to look into this. Um, I just think it it kind of doesn't pass the smell test. I don't care what the conflicts of interest board says. Um, uh, and and John Krawczyk, uh, director, uh, you mentioned uh, in your testimony that the H H H H H T consists of seven employees, three of which are parks employees, and four of which are privately paid staff. Now that, I guess that's that's uh, for your organization does, uh, so uh, Parks pays you, right, uh, Mr. Krawczyk? Correct. Okay, uh, and uh, so this is the thing I have a problem with, that you're a separate not-for-profit, yet city's paying you. Um, so, you know, again, what do, you know, for your board, what do the Parks employees do on HHT? What do they do? There's four, like you said, there are uh, three of them. Can you give me some of the duties other than your own? 
Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to, to speak to that council member. Um, so it, uh, the Historic House Trust has a license agreement with the New York City Parks Department and with the City of New York, which clearly outlines um, our responsibilities um, in and our role in um, helping to facilitate and promote the 23 historic houses. And so in that, it's an important um, sort of guide for both um, me as the executive director, as well as my board, who has the fiduciary responsibility for the nonprofit organization to assist with these houses. And like many of the um, parks nonprofits that came out of the 1980s, they were really formed to facilitate the work in um, specific parks and with specific parks resources to make sure that they could assist the city and supplement what the city could do with private, a private fundraising arm or the ability to bring additional resources to these, um, to these sites. And in the case of the Historic House Trust, it's the, the originally 15 houses, which is now up to 23, um, that, um, that are, 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 are what we live to do. It's what, what my board, many of my board members are founding board members of 30 years have been very committed to this work. So um, as part of this agreement with the city, the city understands that um, having 23 separate nonprofit organizations sort of under our umbrella is a big task. Um, having 23 house sites, some of them with multiple buildings is an even bigger task. And so they realize that, that for a, a small nonprofit, we are definitely not the Central Park Conservancy, but for a small nonprofit, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very challenging situation from a staffing perspective on um, how, how you- Time expired. Uh, I just want to get one other question in, because uh, uh, do individual houses ever conduct fundraising for the purpose of raising funds to, to, uh, for repairs for, uh, for the house? On occasion, they do, yes. On occasion, get approval from your office? They have to get approval for to perform the work um, on, on city-owned buildings um, and on properties that have landmark designation. Okay. Are, we all, have to that. okay. Are all the historic houses under your jurisdiction in the city of New York? Uh, all of the, the houses that are member houses, the 23, are, um, are, are in our license agreement. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, can, are you going to do a second round, uh, Chair Ku, of questions? Uh, we will do a second round, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other members who want to speak, I mean, who want to ask questions? Next, uh, next up is Council Member Cohen, followed by Council Member Levine. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you guys for your testimony. Uh, um, so each house has its own board under your organization. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, I, I don't know. Do you play a role in like evaluating which, which houses are run well and which houses are struggling or not run? I mean, boards vary in strength and sometimes, you know, for whatever reason, these, these not-for-profits have internal difficulties. Uh, how would you rate sort of the, the health of the boards? under the, the trust? Overall, I would say that uh, they're very good. Um, and, you know, they're, they're every, everything from operating budgets, you know, of, you know, $70,000 a year to, you know, five times that. And so we have a real range of um, ability, depending what, on, again. What, what makes the one successful to the point where they have such a big, you know, where they're generating high numbers of visitors, they're, they're generating, able to raise money privately. What's the difference between ones that do a very good job of that and ones that struggle? I, um, I guess my own per personal perspective on it is that a lot of it has to do with location um, and uh, location to particular resources, as well as a lot of hard work on the part of those houses that have worked in many cases for decades to sort of build a following um, um, in addition to being in proximity to um, the resources uh, who are the people that, uh, that can come there. Um, and so I don't know that I have any one particular answer for the success of one versus another, um, but I do feel like there is something to be said for um, uh, proximity or, or location that is really um, 
uh, resulted in the great success of some of our houses. Um, while others have really, um, I, to answer your question, I don't feel like any of them at this point, any of our 23 houses is, is struggling in a way that I have concerns about. And my organization is there to help all of them. It's actually the reason we exist, not just to raise money, but to provide support on every level, whether it's capital projects, maintenance and operations, governance of their boards. Uh, my board members consist of people who are very knowledgeable about all aspects of that. And I rely on them as well at times for advice on, um, on assisting our, our house sites. I'll just say, I, I think that you know, you know, I worked closely with, uh, with the mayor in the last budget and we got a, a, a huge grant for uh, uh, the Van Cortland house. Yes, thank and, you. And, and the, the Valentine Barian house is in my district. But I, I'll tell you, this is just anecdotally, like I, I really struggled about what to do uh, with the Van Cortland house for many years uh, because I, I thought it was underutilized in, the, in, in as an asset. I, I didn't think that enough people used it. And it was a little bit of a chicken and an egg situation and that their, you know, their ADA accessibility limited um, their ability, you know, for, for school programming. But it still seems to me to be, you know, an underutilized resource in this city. That there's so much history there. It's such a, you know, an amazing facility in, a, you know, in an amazing setting. It's accessible by the subway. Um, trying to promote these as an asset in the city, and and I think ultimately being able to generate some revenue to support them better. Uh, and maintain them, which which we you know everyone acknowledges is is difficult that they're expensive to maintain. Uh, I, I just think that we need to do more to support them in 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 their ability to program in a way that helps them become more sustainable. Thank you, Councilmember, and, and noted. Um, uh, I'd like to thank you for for those comments. It's always helpful to hear feedback on on your perspective. And I, I would just add, uh, Councilmember, as you very well know the um, recently, relatively recently uh, finalized Van Cortland Park Alliance um, agreement, um, I, I think added a little jet fuel to that park and uh, a little support to all of its assets along with um, the welcome addition of Stephanie, Stephanie Ehrlich as a Van Cortland Park Administrator. So um, I, I personally am looking forward to more and further programming and developments across that park. Yeah, and I, and I think when the house ultimately, you know, I know we're only at the very beginning of this process, but when the house is at the other end of it, I hope that it, it really becomes a, a showcase and and a destination in the city for people to come see one of, you know, premier historic homes in the city. It's an amazing place. It really is. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We'll now hear from Councilmember Levine. Time starts now. Councilmember Levine, are you there? No. Hello, I apologize. Uh, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you all hear me okay? Excellent. Um, I want to start by thanking John Krushek for, for your service to Parks and your many roles over the years um, and for your work with the Historic House Trust now, which is extremely important citywide and, uh, and in northern Manhattan. I live just a few blocks from um, the Morris Jamel Mansion, which is just an absolutely precious institution um, that, that I truly love. And uh, I just wanna, I wanna ask you about uh, the capital process, um, which in the best of circumstances in uh, New York City is complicated. And uh, I, I wanna understand the extent to which um, it may be more complicated because you have the Parks Department HHT and then individual 501c3s managing some of these houses. Um, can you start by explaining our, our um, capital allocations from the city made to HHT or to individual houses? So the, the allocations, and thank you, Council Member Levine. Um, uh, it's good to see you again, and we appreciate uh, the fact that you love our, our historic houses that are, are near your district. Um, yes, um, uh, the, the Historic House Trust does not receive um, direct capital funding um, that comes to our organization. Um, we actually, in our license agreement, don't have any 
um, any sites that are specifically identified for our use with the exception of the arsenal where our offices are located. We are allocated space there to conduct our operations. Um, and so when we do request an allocation for capital funding, um, it is allocated um, through um, council members, um, all of you, as well as borough presidents and on occasion the mayor, um, site specific. Uh, and what we do have the ability to do is to receive those funds on behalf of the city uh, and to manage the design and the construction contracts through something called the sole source agreement that we have with the city. Um, it actually is um, a, a, a process that helps with efficiency, with how things get done. And not only with efficiency, it helps with um, the specialty work that is needed at these house sites. Um, as you can imagine, these are historic houses. Many of them are wood structures or have old masonry. And so we do need to make sure that those spe the specialty nature of them is understood in the, in, the, in the contracting. So that is one of the services we provide and we have the ability to um, really um, facilitate that in a very um, um, close way and a, and a careful way through our sole source. I, I appreciate that. And so, sorry to interrupt only because uh, the clock is ticking and, and uh, I just want to follow up. So um, uh, it sounds like HHT is in the driver's seat then for capital. Are, are there conditions where an individual house would just need to pay uh, out of its own funds for, for repair work or something larger um, because they need to act quickly, for example, and the normal process is too slow? There have been situations where that has occurred. Um, as we all know that the city's procurement process uh, is very important for us to uphold and understand with PPB rules, it's, it's critical. And there have been times when the houses have decided that it would be one less expensive for them to do it on their own and quicker. Um, they're very rare when that happens, but um, there are examples where that has occurred. And we appreciate the partnership and the houses very often also um, uh, I think, ha appreciate the opportunity to help out when they can. Is, is course, there a risk that considering you have dozens of, of wonderful houses under your auspices, that you'll have finite bandwidth for capital work and that that could create something of a backup um, uh, that could mean ultimately a, a slowdown in, in the pace of the capital process for some of the houses? We have a plan for that, which is uh, we're not the only ones that are managing capital projects. Um, as I mentioned in my testimony, we have a sole source agreement, so we have the ability there to manage things. But we also will be working very closely with the Parks Department Capital Division, as well as DDC, to accomplish um, all of the capital work that is presently happening at our house sites. Understood. Uh, but, you know, delays are, are a problem for the parks system in the best of circumstances. And we just want to make sure that we're not adding a layer of complexity uh, that would only slow down these processes even further for these houses which are juggling uh, such challenges at this time. Um, uh, are, are, are there plans to streamline uh, the capital process for historic houses in any way? Time expired. John, I think you can still answer that. Can I still answer? Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, so to answer your question, uh, council member, um, uh, we're always working internally at the Historic House Trust on how to streamline our process because of, again, the additional layers that are involved with dealing with the historic property. Um, and whether that is um, getting the house um, into procurement, in design, or uh, an unanticipated um, issue that may come up in construction, which very often happens with older houses. Um, we um, have a really great team at the Historic House Trust. Um, uh, presently, it's one person. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do have one vacancy. Um, and our hope is that once that vacancy is filled, we'll be able to sort of you know, move forward uh, even more expediently. Uh, but in the meantime, we do have our partners at the Capital Division at Parks as well as DDC um, that also can assist us with moving our historic house site projects forward with oversight from the Historic House Trust. Uh, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but um, but I, I'm uh, we are certainly doing our best to uh, to facilitate moving this for this this work forward expediently. It's important in order to keep our houses in good health. Um, uh, absolutely, and we do our best to um, to really move that forward. So. I, I appreciate that, and I apologize. I was, I was momentarily on mute, oh. and my time has expired. So thank you, John, um, and thank you, Chair Koo, very much. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, we'll thank you. We'll now what? hear from Cheku. Did you? Did you you have more members uh, want to yeah. ask questions? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Good. Council member, Council member Rivera would like to ask a question next. Well, before that, I, I want to say, uh, Council Member, we are joined by Council Member Bavali. Thank you. Time starts now. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you for being here and answering our questions. I guess uh, I want to just start with the, the Merchant's House, which is in my district. Earlier in my term, there was a potential development being considered next door. It could have seriously damaged the structural integrity of the Merchant's House. And while I did successfully uh, get get that development that development stop. I was con concerned that the parks department really didn't take a strong enough role in ensuring the museum was protected from any adjacent construction. And so while parks did send a letter saying that the Merchant's House Museum should be protected, buildings like this should have real parks oversight and access to resources. And parks should have provided a real engineering analysis in this case. So my question is, do you think parks should have more of a role in the long-term planning and capital efforts to shore up and protect these properties from effects of nearby construction, climate change, and other issues, instead of what is essentially happening, which is relying on the benevolence of others and private donors? And then my other question, and this is the only other question I have, um, and I guess I could wait, but um, how does funding of these properties reflect larger equity concern. You know what, I'll wait, I'll wait until you answer the first one. Sorry. I was afraid of time expiring, but the chair- Thank you, Council Member Rivera. I'm happy to jump in quickly and, and answer your question. It's good to see you again as well. Um, and we appreciate your support um, during the whole situation with the developer next door to merchants. Um, I, I know we work very closely in partnership with you and with the Merchants House Association. So, so to answer your question, what we do rely on very often is um, the expertise that I had mentioned earlier, that historic house trust brings and our sort of network of of supporters, whether they're volunteer supporters or whether they are paid um, consultants that really have the expertise to look at something like the Merchant's House, which dates to 1832 and has all of the original interiors and furnishings and is a really precious and special resource. Um, uh, generally to find the individuals that really understand uh, historic plaster work of that nature or buildings of those types, you really need to go to specialty engineers and architects. And we don't always have them on staff at New York City Parks because very often they are working on sort of more traditional parks related resources. And that is the reason why HHT exists. And it actually is the reason why our house partners exist. Um, that even though we take a strong role in capital projects and maintenance and operations, um, it, it doesn't preclude us from partnering with them to help us with that when needed. Uh, we like to try to avoid it when possible so that their private resources can really go into programming and events. But there are times when they can draw on their own resources to assist us. And in the case of merchants, they did. Uh, brought in really incredible consultants quickly um, and uh, gave us really the specialty expertise that we needed to really push back um, and make sure that this house would survive construction if it were to be approved. Um, and so, um, so that, I guess, is my short answer to say that those resources did not exist, the, the preservation resources within parks. So we definitely needed to go outside of, of the city for that. Um, and it's not a reflection on, on parks. It's more of just the nature of the work that we do is so specialized. And then lastly, um, did you have an qu equity question? Uh, I did, I did. And, and thank you for your answer. I, you know, Merchant's House is in the Soho NoHo area. So it's, you know, in a more affluent neighborhood where they can rely on the benevolence of others and, and private donors and, and wealthy families. However, my other question, I guess, is, is particularly around equity and how does funding of these properties reflect larger equity concerns around parks funding and specifically what efforts are made to prioritize funding for houses in communities with limited open space or limited cultural institutions? How do historic houses work to help students from other parts of the city access these kinds of resources? So um, I, I could, um, and I'm not sure, uh, Commissioner Biederman, uh, if you would like to speak about um, Commissioner Silver's work in general for parks um, with CPI and other initiatives um, that are equity initiatives that are specific to NYC parks. Um, but certainly that is, um, has positively uh, affected at least two of our house sites. 
Um, Van Cortland House actually, and Council Member Cohen's district is the recipient of CPI funds for the improvement of an entrance right near the house. Um, and King Manor um, in Jamaica, Queens is another one where the entrances to that park will greatly improve access by the public um, to enjoy the historic resource that is right in, in their neighborhoods. Um, there could be other um, general initiatives, and I know this is a historic house hearing, so perhaps the- Time expired. Is related to um, equity for historic houses, but Commissioner Biederman, I don't know if you or Matt Drury would like to further add to that. I just, you know, it, I, as you noted, John, um, uh, and I'm sure um, uh, Council Member Rivera knows well that the um, uh, Commissioner Silver is very, very focused on equity. It, it really is in the DNA of the agency since he came on. Um, and it, just one thing I just want to highlight um, that uh, you you noted, John, is that you know we it, these uh, houses don't exist in isolation, or most of them don't. I think the his, um, Merchant's House is kind of a unique case because it sits in the middle of a block, right? Not next to a park or uh, not abutting a park or not in the middle of them. Most of them, most of these houses are within parks. So they uh, do benefit from park resources, which as you know, this agency takes, um, takes our commitment to equity, not only in capital work, but um, in maintenance and operations and programming very seriously. So um, that commitment to equity is translated just on the borough level um, as we do capital work and as we do maintenance work in the spaces surrounding these parks. Sorry, and I, I, I just, I just add, and John, please, you know, feel free to fill in. But I think many of the houses have also forged amazing relationships with other local, you know, school visits from local school children, and or, or actually, frankly, since, since these are citywide resources, you know, visits from school children all, all over the city. And I know there's been, you know, uh, a lot of great, you know, relationships and efforts sort of forged in that manner. And COVID notwithstanding, you know, obviously, I, I think that's something that the, the, the agency is absolutely looking to kind of continue and deepen. And I would further add that the Dykeman Farmhouse is another house that, although it wasn't specifically funded through the CPI program, um, Community Parks Initiative, um, uh, it does have a significant amount of funds for restoration. And so we're now in the process of hiring a designer to really um, look at the approach to that house, especially the accessibility approach. It's quite high up off of Broadway. Um, and to really implement some of Commissioner Silver's great ideas for um, park equity and park initiatives, opening up the corners of the house, really bringing the public um, um, into the site in a way that um, lets people know that this really important house exists um, 20 feet above Broadway because of the elevation changes. Thank you for answering my questions. Um, you know, again, my concern is always about equity and, and though Merchant's House, I was kind of disappointed with how things unfolded. Um, I was glad that I was able to help them with those discretionary funds. I know not every historic house is so lucky and, and realizing that Parks is historically underfunded. Um, you know, I hope we can work together to just to make sure that we're addressing some of the, the issues that I brought up in my questioning. Thank you for answering it. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thanks for all that you do. Thank you. We'll now return to Chairman Ku, who has an additional round of questions and he'll be followed by Council Member Holden, who has an additional round of questions. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Director uh, Quattro, you brought up licensed uh, houses uh, multiple times. Our understanding is that some of these agreements are expired. So can you tell us how many have expired licenses? Hello? John, you're muted. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, yes, I'd be happy to answer that, Chair Koo. Um, uh, many of the license agreements have been extended um, by, by letter. And typically they are extended from anywhere from six months to one year um, once they get an extension. And uh, HHT is presently in the process of working closely with NYC Parks General Counsel to look at renewing the license agreements. Many of them, uh, the language is... Um, you know, from uh, a decade or so ago. And so it's time to do an, an update on that and to really have discussions with our house partners, um, with the NYC Parks about how we can continue to collaborate um, to benefit these sites. 
um, and upgrade the and update the, the license agreement. So there are some that are expired. I don't have the exact number, um, but uh, it's a fairly um, easy process uh, and they do continue on. It's not like uh, once the license agreement expires that, that it's not in effect. Um, and many of them have been extended by letter. So they are in effect. Thank you. Uh, last time I, I visited the barn house. I'm sure you know about the barn house in my district, right? I noticed that there were uh, several outstanding repairs, uh, including the leaking sink, uh, which is the uh, only public bathroom, and also dangling ceiling fixtures wrapped in black electrical tape. Uh, this was a year ago. Have those things have, have been repaired? Uh, I would have to get back to you, uh, Councilmember Ku. I don't have a specific um, answer on those repairs. Um, I am aware of those situations, and so um, I'd be happy to look into it and circle back to you and the, the Banhaus uh, Historical Society. Uh, going back to the previous question, you said some uh, houses, they have expired licenses. Can you tell us how many are expired? Um, the the overall agreements of the houses of the of the of the 23 we actually have uh, 21 agreements uh, because one of the agreements has two houses on it so it's technically oh. 22 um, and that would be the Bronx County Historical Society has two houses within their license agreement um, but the master agreements um, have have all expired but they've been extended by by letter. And so, as I had stated earlier, our plan is to work very closely with NYC Parks General Council to, um, to update those um, and to work with our house partners um, to um, have the new agreements in effect. Okay. Uh, so when historic houses are funded for capital projects, how is the funding and the project handled? Uh, who determined the contracting agency? And who has oversight over the budget, uh, over the project? So um, uh, NYC Parks has the jurisdiction um, at all of the historic house trust sites. Uh, and, um, uh, and there's one sort of anomaly, which is uh, historic Richmond town where the parkland, um, uh, the land on which the structures, the village sits is parkland, but the structures are under the jurisdiction of the Department of Cultural Affairs. And so that's sort of one specialty um, situation. Um, but in general, um, you know, NYC Parks has the jurisdiction on behalf of the city. These are city owned properties. And so, um, so NYC Parks, um, ultimately Commissioner Silver um, would have the final say and all projects are brought to him for approval design projects. He has a chance to see them um, and become familiar with them. Uh, and he always enjoys seeing our historic house uh, projects. So, so to answer your question, um, uh, uh, Parks has the sort of final say on what happens on the properties the city owns. Um, but we work collaboratively with our house partners on those design projects and get their input so that we really understand um, their needs. And the advocacy for the funding can either come from Parks, HHT, our house partners, as far as securing the capital funds. And I'm sure many of you are aware of, of, uh, of those meetings. Um, you've had them with our house partners, as well as with NYC Parks, our borough commissioners and their staff, um, probably with Matt Drury and others um, when it comes time to do new needs requests. And so it's always a team effort and, uh, and we enjoy the process and always appreciate when we have much needed capital dollars assigned to our house sites. Thank you. Please explain to, uh, the role of HHT and Parks in terms of capital projects. What is Parks responsible for and what is the trust responsible in terms of moving capital projects forward? So um, with regard to um, the responsibilities, we divide the responsibilities, but always work closely with NYC Parks ultimately on all of our projects, even our pass-through projects. Um, and presently we have um, uh, uh, at least three pass-through projects that HHT is working on directly. And so we take a, a more active role um, in that and facilitating the um, moving forward of of those particular projects. But regardless, HHT, whether the projects are being done at NYC Parks Capital or at DDC, 
um, we have a role in being present at the table um, and really helping to oversee and push forward with, with the work. And so it's always a collaboration um, and um, we're always working to, to move the projects forward in an efficient manner um, so that we can get into construction and, and perform the necessary work that's needed on these historic buildings. Uh, I, have just, I have secured over $2.5 million for the barn house for interior and exterior renovations and a visitor center. So what is the current status of the interior uh, renovation? My understanding is that it was stopped despite funding being moved to complete it. Can you exp uh, tell us the status yes. of the interior? So the, uh, the interior restoration project is a project that's being done at the Department of Design and Construction. Um, the project had moved forward to the point where we were pretty close to completing the design work on the project. Um, and then it got um, estimated in order to determine um, were the allocated funds enough to, um, to bid the project out. And we determined that there was a funding shortfall in that particular case. Um, but um, uh, many of our projects, as you may be aware, have been on hold since the pandemic has started. And so um, all of the GDC projects presently have been paused. Um, and so once those um, are released and once we have determined how to address the funding shortfall, then the interior restoration project, which is a really special and incredible project that we're excited to move forward with. Um, then once, once that, th those two particular situations are worked out, um, we have every hope that it will move forward in a, a quick and efficient manner. With regard to the visitor center, that is another project that we believe is um, significantly underfunded, um, just based on current um, prices that have been coming in for city bid work. Uh, and so that would be another one, Councilmember Ku, that we'd love to work with you and our other elected officials in Queens, um, if they can sort of assist us with determining how to sort of address that, that shortfall. Um, but that one has not moved into design again, um, right when we were getting ready to have discussions about um, where the visitor center stood with DDC, um, our projects um, were paused and they remain paused. Well, the longer parks uh, takes, the more money it will cost, you know, because it takes a long time for you guys to design something. So can you give us a, a breakdown of how much funding remaining in, each, uh, in both projects? Uh, yes, um, let me just see if I can bring up my spreadsheet here. Um, and also, can you tell me like, uh, when is the project going under EDC and when does it go to Parks Department? Oh yes, I apologize that I didn't answer your question on that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it depends, it's, uh, it can be a combination of reasons. Um, one, if we're feeling like HHT and or um, NYC Parks Capital does not have the capacity to move forward with the project, we have a very nice arrangement with the Department of Design and Construction um, in order to um, facilitate work um, on parkland in general, but specifically our historic houses. And because they do have a preservation department, we're very fortunate to have that partnership with Design Department of Design and Construction to assist us with parks projects, including our historic houses. Um, and so, and sometimes our house partners prefer to work with an agency they've worked with before. And so uh, at their request, they, um, you know, it may be done either through HHT's sole source contract or through the Department of Design and Construction and or through the Parks Department Capital Division. So it's always a, a conversation um, and a discussion on, um, on where we feel the project can sort of best move forward. And to answer your question about the remaining funds, the um, interior restoration project currently is funded for three million nine hundred and nine thousand, and the visitor center project has four point nine five five million remaining. But you you said the money is not still not enough. Not enough. Correct. So how yeah. much is the shortfall? How uh, the shortfall? Uh, I apologize, Chair Ku. I don't have that information directly in front of me, but I'd be happy to get back to you with um, with that figure. Okay. Yeah. Please get back to us. Okay. And and for the visitor center, until DDC reactivates projects, um, they they um, they aren't able to have their 
um, consultants um, come up with that, what that exact figure is. So again, that would be one that I'd be happy to circle back to you on. Okay. So uh, my last question is, uh, do any of the houses or a representative on their behalf sit on the trust board? No. Um, no? Presently, there, presently, there are not any um, houses on the New York, the, on the Historic House Trust uh, Board of Directors. Is there a reason why? A conflict of interest or what? Uh, I don't believe it's a conflict of interest, um, uh, but I wouldn't be able to say. I think that would be something I would want to have a discussion with my board chair about. Um, and so, um, uh, but we work very closely with the houses. So I, uh, I wouldn't want to give the impression that, that we aren't communicating with them on a regular basis. We do, um, but whether that would result in a seat on our board is something that my organization, I think, um, would have to have an internal conversation about. Our goal is always to represent the houses collectively across the board and to make sure they all have representation and that it's not obviously just one particular site um, that, uh, that has special access or you know, um, a, a particular role at the site. Uh, but it is something that I think um, in light of conversations I've recently had with many of my house directors that we'd be happy to consider a stronger role for them in our organization and to really um, hear, hear from them about their needs. Um, collectively, um, because again, we always want to make sure that we're really being as fair as possible to all 23 sites, which is um, sometimes hard to do, um, especially when certain um, opportunities come up to, for funding at sites that have particular themes, for instance. Um, but, uh, but it is something that we always strive to do at Historic House Trust is to really um, uh, work with them collectively as a whole, all 23 sites. So I think it's important uh, for you to have a representative uh, to represent all the houses to sit on the board. Otherwise, you, uh, it's easier for you to manage because this, you know, communication is easier because they have a board member on the trust. And uh, my last question actually is, um, how does um, a Parks Department help provide PPE to, to, to the houses? And or any other uh, or any other types of COVID nineteen support related support. So, I, I, John, I think you know the details of um, the PPE distribution to the houses better than I do, but I can, I can talk generally if you want to go first. Sure. So I'd be happy to address that. Um, uh, we didn't have any direct involvement with the applications that the houses made, um, but we were very much in touch with all of them on regular weekly calls um, after the shutdown in March to make sure that we were all communicating on opportunities to apply for PPP loans, where to get them. Um, I don't know if a lot of you remember the big scramble of a lot of nonprofits and other businesses to really have access to PPP loans. It was a pretty... Uh, frightening time. And, um, you know, I, I think we were all trying to make sure that we got our applications in before, um, uh, you know, before um, the, the loans dried up, including the Historic House Trust. We applied for a PPP loan and received it, um, as did many of our house sites. Um, not all of them, but most of them um, did receive PPP assistance. Um, we have very skilled directors and, and all of them are skilled fundraisers at our, our house sites. It's really um, the collaboration that we cherish at the Historic House Trust and at New York City Parks that not only is it my board of 27 board members uh, who are all volunteers, but when you multiply that out over 21 other boards, um, 22, um, it really um, creates a great um, sense of community and a, and a great sense of, of power that we have to really assist our historic house sites collectively with the important fundraising that has to be done. So we really rely on all of those volunteer board members at each of those sites to be doing that very same thing that HHT is doing every day. Um, and they do it very effectively and uh, thankfully most of them receive PPP loans. So all these individual houses, they apply uh, PPP loans uh individually or, or co collectively by, by the trust? Individually. Um, uh, the, the Historic House Trust would not have been able to have applied for PPP loans for the houses because their employees are not on our payroll. And as part of receiving a PPP loan, you had to provide pretty um, strong proof that someone was a full-time or they could be part-time in some instances, 
uh, but but they they had to, they could not be a 1099 employee. They had to be a full time employee of the organization, and you had to prove that. Uh, from past payroll history. So our organization would not have been able to have applied on behalf of the house sites for PPP loans. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, now we go to second round of uh, questions by other council members. Chris, thank is the yeah. council member uh, still on? Yes, thank you Chair Cook. Council member Holden does have a question. Time starts now. Thank you Chair Ku, and thank you for the second round. Um, I just want to touch upon the uh, capital projects again. Um, parks projects almost all the time cost much more than any other capital projects in this city. And I've had a history with parks for 30 years and, and working with parks and overseeing it. Um, so I'm just saying on uh, certain capital projects, I mean, I, this could be for anybody, but um, wouldn't it be better if the historic house trust was able to secure the money, give it to the houses and allow them to put it to better use and, and get a better price. For instance, uh, the Trust for Public Land, which I, I've worked with, often do it, the capital projects, cheaper, better, and on time, much more than uh, my experience with parks. So couldn't we restructure some way to do capital projects that really doesn't necessarily go to the Parks Department? Because everybody, you could talk to every council member and they'll say the same thing, that the the capital projects are ridiculous through parks. They take too long and they cost too much. Um, council member, if I could, and then I will happily defer to John the, um, uh, the details on the historic houses. Um, thanks for the question. I, I certainly hear the um, frustration with um, that capital projects and parks can take some time. I, you know, I, I would be remiss not to note um, in our defense that Commissioner Silver has shaped an average of about, um, I believe, six to nine months of the overall capital um, uh, process with a, a set of reforms that we could just do ourselves here at Parks. Council member, I'm sure you know about it already. We have spoken about it before, um, but I, I do just want to note that. I, I believe that, and John, please step in, that um, the reason why the capital process with HHT works the way that it does is that um, this is parks property, this is city property, so it must be handled by directly by the parks department. Um, uh, well, well, Commissioner, just uh, the Trust for Public Lands does work on city property too. So uh, we, we're, not, uh, we're not separate and apart. Yes, they're, they're owned by parks or at least, but the Trust for Public Land does work on school property. They work on properties all over uh, public lands. So um, we're not coming up with something very different here as a concept. I'm certainly happy to explore it more. I myself off the top of my head um, cannot think of an instance where we have TPL, we love TPL, they're great, but where we um, have worked with TPL on a piece of um, parkland proper, you know, capital P parkland, but um, certainly something I'm happy to look into. I may be wrong. All right. Uh, can, I, I just want to talk about the license uh, agreement again. Um, uh, and I, John uh, Krauchik, I, I just like to ask, uh, you said you didn't know how many license agreements, uh, I think there's 23, but how many, when, when the chair asked you how many expired, you didn't know. Um, that seems like weird because why wouldn't you know that? Um, I mean, you only have 23 agreements. I mean, if I was a director, I would say, yeah, I got five that, you know, or 10 or whatever. Why would they, wouldn't that be a top priority of your office or the parks department? to not let them expire? I, 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 John, I know- John, John, this is John Crouch. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm happy to respond to that council member and thank you for the question. Um, uh, just for clarity, I, I um, uh, and I know it was sort of a, uh, a bit of an explanation as I was, I was describing the expired license agreements, but they are all expired. Um, and, and they all, and then some of them are extended by letter agreement. Typically we do that when, um, when there's um, a requirement to use the document uh, for a specific purpose um, uh, that might be, um, you know, um, procuring funds for capital project at that site. Um, it's an immense amount of work um, in order to um, really um, move forward with all of the capital projects. And we're actually just on the verge of or, or, or all of the um, license agreements. And we're just on the verge of starting that process with um, our general counsel's office. 
Um, it's um, usually they're working on um, multiple, uh, there are multiple um, organizations uh, that are affiliated with parks that have license agreements, but it's one license agreement. Um, our organization has 23, which I think makes up a percentage of the license agreements that the parks department holds. So I guess I don't want to um, downplay um, the, um, the, uh, uh, the amount of time that it's going to take to make sure we're working very closely and carefully with all of our house partners to make sure that those agreements are satisfactory. Yeah, but, but let me, let me just jump parts. in because my time's going to expire. But sure. this is like your job right, to manage these license agreements. And, and the fact that all of them expired on because it's a lot of work. Time um, expired. You know, I, yeah, I get that. My time expired. But obviously, something is not being done that should be done. And uh, I just want to ask one other question because. Uh, uh, can you tell us, uh, you know, exactly what kind of input the individual <laughs> houses have in decision making? Uh, where does their ownership end and historic house trust begin? Because this, this is a thing I'm, 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 I'm wrestling with because you work for the Parks Department and uh, the trust, uh, the, the houses are, 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 you know, trying to do what they have to do. But I mean, I, I mean, there's there seems to be a gray area here. And it sounds like the Parks Department can just heavy handedly uh, dictate to the, to the houses. So I wanna know if there's a give and take enough that the houses are happy and you're happy. So we, all, we always strive to have collaborative relationships um, with all of our house directors and their um, various boards. They all have um, you know, uh, volunteer boards that they work with. Um, and I would, I would like to think I have a very good relationship with them. Um, it doesn't mean that it's not a, a perfect relationship or, or that it isn't without some little hiccups along the way. Um, but in general, we are always available and, um, and very often reaching out to communicate with our historic houses, um, doing the best that we can managing a very complex portfolio. Um, and this isn't meant to diminish anything, um, any concerns that might be raised um, about um, perhaps how that relationship works. Um, but um, I would hope that the, our house directors and their boards feel that HHT is working very hard for them in order to uh, facilitate the important work that they, they do on site. And that includes the license agreements. And I do want to come back to that just for one quick second that, um, that you know, although they have expired, they continue um, and they continue very much in a way that Parks is pretty comfortable with. Um, these are agreements that are, you know, in some cases, maybe 10 years old and still valid and still operational. Our goal is to absolutely to get to them um, and, um, and, um, and juggling again, um, the, all of the incredible workload uh, with the finite resources that, that we have available to us at HHT as well as at N N NYC Parks. And so um, I just want to assure you that no, um, but, but John, nothing- maybe, maybe you should, because I mean, I've, I've spoken to a number of houses, and a lot of them, and as a parks committee uh, member, um, I'm hearing a frustration that I've never heard before. So I, I just think there's no there's no reason to have a license expire because it's a lot of work, or or then there's no reason to have an expiration date um, if we're going to allow them everyone to expire. And and I'm hearing a consistent message here that there's a frustration dealing with the historic house trust. And I think you need better communications because I'm hearing it from, and I, and I can tell you, it's it's double figures of how many frustrate how many frustrated houses we're hearing from, and something's not working. So we need to revamp something. We need better communications, but we need accountability um, from not only your office but from Parks uh, that give these give these houses a better ability to raise money on their own. If Parks is going to, you know, keep them hanging on projects for years and years and years that that are necessary to to really have the house survive, because we're not hearing that. We're hearing projects to go on and on since 2005. There's projects that haven't been done, and the houses are in jeopardy. So I think we need better communications. I think we, I think that Parks uh, Committee, we needed um, to have more of these hearings than the last one we had 15 years ago. So uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, um, so Parks, you have to get rid of the trees and go to the uh, get to the license agreements. Uh, is, 
it sounds like you guys are really behind on a lot of things, you no? Know? So, of course, I we want you to improve, and and especially on those contracts. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, are there any more members who want to ask questions? There are none, Chair Koo. So now we go to uh, public uh, participation. Yes. Thank you to the Parks Department and the Historic House Trust. Uh, we'll now turn to public testimony for the first group of panelists representing various historic houses. Uh, they will present their testimony as one panel since they are located together in one location. I will be calling on each individual on the panel to speak in turn, so please wait until I call on you to deliver your testimony. Once called, please state your name and the organization you represent once you begin. Council members who have questions for this panel should use the Zoom hand raise function, and I will call on you after the entire panel has completed their entire testimony to ask any questions. For all other panelists, unlike our council hearings, our typical council hearings rather, we will be calling on individuals one, one by one to testify. Uh, so please begin once your name has been called. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should also use the Zoom hand raise function. And I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. Uh, once the historic house panel has completed their testimony, we will hear testimony from Maria Beche uh, and followed by Maria Carrasco. I will now call the historic house panel to testify and I will ask Ran Yan of Latimer House to begin her testimony, please. <laughs> Hi. Good afternoon, Chair Ku and members of the Parks Committee. We're thankful that the committee is holding this hearing and allowing us to testify. My name is Rania. I'm from the Louis Latimer House Museum. The New York City Council last held a hearing on the historic houses in 2005. A lot has changed in the last 15 years, and we're excited to share updates with the committee today. This testimony is representative of 14 of the independent nonprofit organizations that fall within the Historic House Trust. Together, we represent nearly 95% of the visitorship of these historic sites, which are located on all five boroughs, most in areas less traveled by traditional tourists. In our institutions are part of New York City's rich cultural fabric and tell the story of the mosaic that make up the city we all love. We are Bartow Pell Mansion Museum in the Bronx, Hendrick Lodge House, Old Stone House, and Wyckoff House Museum in Brooklyn, Dykeman Farmhouse, Merchants House Museum, and Morris Jamel Mansion Museum in Manhattan. The Bound House, King Manor Museum, Kingsland Homestead, Louis Latimer House Museum, and Queens County Farmhouse in Queens, Alice Austin House, and Historic Richmond Town in Staten Island. For the ease of facilitating this important hearing, many of us gathered here at nationally designated site of LGBTQ history, Alice Austin House on Staten Island, and that's the mask wearing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We'll now hear from Kelsey Brow of King Manor, uh, followed by Branfman. Yes, I'm Melissa Branfman from the White Cloud House. Kelsey will follow. Okay. Apologies. Um, okay. So when the Historic House Trust was first established, we were a smaller collection of 15 houses in varying stages of infrastructure, and most with modest budgets and no substantive funding potential. At the time, most of these institutions were run by volunteers and local boards who were passionate but lacked the operational capital and marketing experience. And so despite the best of intentions, they were limited in what they could achieve. In the past two decades, our nonprofits have grown. Our operating budgets are now over a quarter of a million dollars each, and several of us sustain annual operating budgets much higher than that. Our staffs have evolved, 
providing the leadership and expertise in marketing, communications, and other areas that allow each of us to reach target audiences and partially control our own destinies. We have also grown in the relevance of our missions and the quality of our programming to become vital parts of our immediate communities. We have individually made great strides in the quality, um, sorry, great strides in terms of, in terms of accessibility as well welcoming and serving, serving differently abled and neurodiverse audiences. You're not here merely for an unsustainable audience of one-time visits by a minute audience of historical tourists, but have become part of the fabric of our respective local communities and develop our, develop our customers for life. We invest deeply in our local area as our neighbors are the repeat bus visitors for whom we serve. And we also inspire multi-borough tourism. However, Fundraising is always a challenge. And as I'm sure you are keenly aware, we are often burdened by the dichotomy of operating and capital funding. Accordingly, we seek reciprocal recognition and commensurate support from the city for our investment in our largely underserved communities. Our nonprofits need direct support. Investment in our organizations through capital and operational support is an investment in New York City. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll hear from Kelsey Brown now of King Manor, uh, followed by Jennifer Walden Weprin. Nonprofit organizations are the stewards of these historic sites, which are situated on New York City Parkland throughout the five boroughs. Collectively, we manage buildings and properties that represent over 350 years of New York City history. We value our relationship with Parks Department and look forward to it evolving to more accurately reflect our status as independent nonprofits that are quite different today than that which existed in 1989. Our nonprofits tell the story of how New York City grew around them. And our core work is to provide impactful educational, cultural and enrichment programs, public events and volunteer opportunities for our surrounding communities, often in multiple languages for an immigrant audience. Not one of our houses resides on Museum Mile in Manhattan. In fact, most are primarily in geographically remote residential corners of the city and are recognized in the 2017 Social Impact of the Arts Project as being in areas of low economic well-being. So these highly relevant and meaningful resources that we provide are essential to these underserved communities that are located very far from the city's large cultural organizations. We meet the needs of audiences who cannot or do not visit large museums for geographic, economic, and cultural reasons, making us true community cornerstones in the areas that need it most. As several of those who spoke iterated, each one of our cultural nonprofits makes a difference by enriching our communities, fostering connections, caring for and managing our facilities, and telling stories that matter to our audiences. We don't sit around playing historical dress up. We engage <laughs> youth and vulnerable communities and give them hope as they see themselves reflected in our work. We are safe spaces for critical thinking, for gathering and for learning. We enrich the lives of all who pass through our doors, come across our grounds and access our online materials. In addition to operating within historic landmark buildings owned by the Department of Parks and Recreation, we are also deeply embedded in the cultural sector. In October, 2019, New York City Comptroller Scott M. Stringer released the report, The Creative Economy, Art and Culture in New York City. This report serves as a benchmark for the creative sector and cultural community, and it gives a detailed analysis of what the sector looks like at its strongest. While the, while the report mentions DCLA, the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, Economic Development Corporation, and NYC and Company as agencies that support the creative sector, the Historic House Trust, and the New York City Parks Department are conspicuous in their absence. Two recommendations outlined in the report, which seem particularly apt for our nonprofits are, one, to improve the capital funding process for cultural nonprofits, and two, to deepen our connections to local communities. The report also urges us to, quote, fortify and grow the creative sector and expand access to New Yorkers of all incomes and ethnicities. The city must first and foremost treat the sector as the economic engine and resource center that it is, end quote. The creative sector accounts for 13% of the city's total economic output. The collective economic output of our nonprofits is significant 
and the ability of our individual 501c3s to welcome and be relevant to diverse communities, as mentioned in the controls report, is undeniable. As our city fights back from the COVID-19 public health crisis and fewer people travel to and even within the city, local communities will be the driving force behind the city's economic recovery. We each continually rise to meet the needs of our neighborhoods. As small nonprofits, stewards of parkland and fixtures within our individual communities, we pivoted quickly to adapt our operations to the ensuing health crisis. While our museum do doors were closed, our nonprofits actively addressed the needs of our city citizens from at-home education to food access to health and wellness initiatives, including distributing PPE. Our virtual programming garnered nearly 1 million impressions. Thank you. That, I believe that was Jennifer Walden Weprin, and we'll now hear from uh, Victoria Monroe of the Alice Austin House. Thank you. Thank you. For so many of us, our most urgent need is the autonomy to grow and the city support so that we can sustainably and equitably serve our communities as they too grow and diversify. The need to be nimble has been further amplified during COVID-19. Fresh eyes on the operational structure of Historic House Trust seems necessary so that we, the nonprofits, that manage these historic sites can effectively respond to the needs of our audiences. Moreover, this mission critical work is not possible without ensuring the stability and maintenance of the historic structures that house our nonprofits. We are professional organizations each with a mission statement that guides how we activate our sites. Each of us devotes countless hours of strategic planning, management, fundraising, and creativity to strengthen our organizations. We are collaborative, agile, and resourceful. We hire staff to support our organization's mission and growth. We work with local vendors and collaborate with partners that support this growth. Since the last hearing 15 years ago, we have each grown tremendously. One of the few silver linings of this pandemic is the way it shed light on our nonprofit's ability to respond nimbly to crisis and that our flexibility is key to our ability to be similarly responsive going forward. Although we are historic sites, we are not stuck in the past. We are continually reinventing ourselves as relevant cultural institutions to serve our diverse communities. Fresh eyes on this process will hopefully eliminate redundancies and create transparent and streamlined pathways for us going forward. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share this testimony. And we are happy to answer any questions the committee has, either as a group or as individual sites. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, we'll now turn to Chair Ku, who does have a few questions. Chair Ku, please unmute yourself. Thank you, Chris. And thank you for all of you coming to testify. Uh, we all know the Historic House Trust was created 30 years ago to assist what were then smaller organizations. Each organization has evolved and grown. Are there new needs or supports that each organization or, uh, or the house needs? Uh, I don't know how you guys answer the question. Can you, uh, each house who have, uh, who want to answer, can answer? Sure. Okay, I think I spoke, this is Melissa from the White Hawk House, and I think I spoke to this a little bit in my portion of the testimony. Um, I think it came up earlier, uh, 
when under the when the historic house trust was asked about um, what funding goes directly to the city when we were volunteer run we didn't you know i mean it was it was a wonderful effort by our communities often to save our houses get them landmarked make them a part of parks land um and these are really you know i mean people putting in all that extra labor and um today we have we have staffs ranging from one one full-time employee to four and those come with real costs um, our job requires us to all fundraise our own salaries, plus that of any staff we have to care for these houses, operate them and manage them. So operational support is a very ongoing need. Um, for many of us, we get, we get significant funding through the city, but usually through portals like, um, Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, there is recently been a parks equity initiative, which spoke to, I think, um, I'm sorry, the council member in, in a merchant's house district. Um, however, you know, we get some, I know I can speak for the Wyckoff house. We get something like 40% of our budget through DCLA. We get anywhere from about $5,000 from the parks equity initiative. And we're one of only two sites I know in this room who even get that funding as we're located in East Flatbush. Um, so I think that operational support in a tangible, <laughs> in, a, in some kind of tangible way is, is sig a significant need. Um, as John mentioned, we do get $2,500 a year that the Historic House Trust, Trust fundraises, which we really appreciate. Um, for the White Cup House, I think that operates, that gives us about two and a half days out of the 365 day a year. Um, for some of the sites like Queens Farm, that's not even a full day's operation. Um, and, to, and in the past, you know, I've been here about eight years in the past, there was a point where we were getting more, obviously the fundraising efforts have changed. Um, $2,500 definitely just doesn't go as far as it used to, especially when we're trying to um, practice equitable, um, equitable hiring and um, yeah, just support, support the people who do the work um, in our communities. Um, and then the second major need, I think, really falls into the capital. Uh, support. And that's something I know each of us could share our personal stories and uphill battles. I know that that's, not, that's something that HHT is keenly aware of and certainly their best efforts to try to support it, um, as well as the Parks Department. But I do think it's time to revisit. Um, the last hearing was in 2005, and the Wyckoff House had raised several million dollars, both private and public, for a visitor center. Um, at that point, we had purchased a barn. It's 2020, and we still are hoping for that project to happen. It's been through three different revisions, and we're at the point where that funding now purchases us a comfort station. Um, we are hopeful. Our borough commissioner has been a huge uh, uh, motivating force in, in pushing this through and making it happen. Um, but these are, kind, these are the kinds of day-to-day -day, um, challenges we face on both the operational side and the um, capital. And I'm sure, I don't want to speak for others, but I do know that a few others could probably speak to some of their personal capital or operational challenges. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, my name is Shiloh Holly. I'm from the Marsh de Mansion. I just want to speak a little bit more to capital. Um, so we are currently going through a major reinterpretation plan inside the museum where our private nonprofit has privately fundraised to redo most of our nine period rooms. Um, we have had a pipe burst in our attic in 2018 um, due to, you know, various issues structurally uh, and, um, you know, maintenance concerns that we had. Uh, the flood happened on all four floors of our, our, of our museum. Um, and uh, we were at a point where we need to repair our ceiling in order to re reopen back to the public. And we had to spend about 8% of our operating budget to do that because parks maintenance was unable to do that work for us. Um, so this really speaks to, to you know, concern that we have is we are, we, are make, we are making our sites lively. We are programming the interiors. We are using our own resource to become vibrant, to be vibrant historic sites but our exterior is crumbling around us. Um, and we really need, you know, capital support so we can ensure the longevity of, of our structures. Thank you. 
Uh, anyone else? No. So how does Parks or HHT communicate with you regarding various policy changes, planning, etc.? Are the nonprofits included in the trust decision making process? Can uh, anyone of you answer that? Sure. I'll give I'll give I'll give an introductory shot. Um, I do think that you know I we appreciate again Melissa from the White Cop House in East Flatbush, Brooklyn. Um, we do appreciate that following the pandemic, we've had more communication with the Historic House Trust, which started I think maybe in May with weekly meetings and um, expanded and then became about every other week, which is definitely an improvement from the past years where we met maybe quarterly. Um, so, so that trans, you know, so that certainly built a level of communication. However, as I mentioned, I've worked here about nine, eight or nine years, and it's only through these conversations that we're starting to learn about, you know, about funding, about how, about the way the historic house trust operates. So I think to a certain extent, we've kind of, you know, opened up Pandora's box and we're realizing how much we didn't know about. For instance, you know, one of the things we learned was that when HHT makes their budget for the year, the GOS support, that $2,500 we each get, is not built into the budget, right? That is, if their gala does well and their, the silent auction does well at their gala, that is the money that gets divided up by the house. This year, when they didn't have a gala, I do know that the Historic House Trust and John and Matthew went to the board and really went to bat for us to say they really need their GOS. And we were really pleased that that was able to come through. However, the, the mere fact, and I, and I have expressed this, that our support isn't really built into their budget. In my opinion, a budget is a statement of your values. It's where you put your money and how you operate. And, the, and some of that is public and some of that is private, of course. But um, I, I think it's, it's, you know, again, we appreciate that this communication has enabled us to see these things. Um, but, um, you know, I think, I think we're just starting to get that and some of the other areas we've been advocating to have more, um, more involvement in include things like hiring decisions. Um, I think, you know, some of the positions at Historic House Trust have existed because they've existed, you know, since 1989, but at this point, as we've, as we've, as oh. we've articulated, we've really evolved and some of our needs are different. Some of us have those expertise within our own houses um, and we really can call on each other more than we often need to call on the historic house trust. Um, so, so I think we're building transparency, but as we're sort of unraveling that, we are starting to, we're starting to see the places where it really could be better. And if this agency is really there to advocate for us and support us, um, I think that we could structurally change things so that that support is really um, really involves us in, in how that in how that happens, um, and I certainly see efforts from the historic house trust to move in that direction. Um, and you know, I still I do think nonetheless that we could we could rethink just how it is that that you know we can really be um, we can be called on as the experts for our own site. Anything else, anyone wants to add? Anyone else? Uh, yes, um, Melissa uh, touched on several um, items that relate to the growth of our uh, organizations, whereby many of us already employ uh, staff members, which are important jobs within our boroughs as well, our own communication specialists and social media specialists and such. And so what has come to light, especially through increased communication, is that often the Historic House Trust has begun to grow and increase their positions without actual consultation of what the houses need. And there's either a doubling up, but often a conflict within these roles. And often the Historic Houses are very willing to share and want, of course, the extra exposure for the amazing progressive programming that we're producing. 
but we want to make sure that the messaging that is going out about those programs is correct. Um, you know, it's very sensitive when we deal with, we are dealing with immigrant communities, we are dealing with Black Lives Matter this year. Uh, I, my, my site, of course, is a nationally designated site of LGBTQ history. So I do not want some of my posts taken in, in, in the wrong direction, let's say. And if there is going to be a shared communication, we all need to be at the table. Um, and that, that's really essential. Does anyone else want to speak to that? But it happens across the board. Jennifer. Before you go, Ms. Monroe, could you just please re-identify yourself just for the record? Oh, sorry, Victoria Munro from the Ellis Austin House. Thank you. And I just ask when everyone, when anyone comes back up to speak, just if you could just re-identify yourself just for, for the record and for our transcript keeping purposes. Thank you. Sure. I'm Jennifer Walden Weber, Executive Director of the Queens County Farm Museum. And uh, my comment on communication, um, just I wanted to sort of direct my answer toward how often, surprisingly, some an a parks employee, although well-meaning, will show up at my site without an appointment, unannounced. Today, while we were all gathering here and get, having some lunch prior to this testimony, I got a text that a parks employee wanted to look at our phone lines. Uh, I just showing up, we, you know, we have a busy team, a short staff team. Um, we have many operational issues since we're an oper you know, one of the longest continuing farm sites in New York State, so we have a lot going on. And during my very busy season, September through October, it's very hard for my team to get some time off, so we kind of work those days in between because we're working weekends and around the clock. And so having an operational person to show up unexpected um, and needing to meet either with myself or my director of operations unannounced. Um, it, and also we're not sure they're authorized to be there either. So um, that communication, you know, I've often shared this with John as it happens real time, like who is this person and why are they here? Um, just two weeks ago, out of nowhere, somebody showed up first thing in the morning um, and hung two bathroom signs as a silly example. Um, in our in the barn, where the only public restrooms on the site are in our barn complex, which is where our offices are, and they are have the incorrect hours of our restrooms, um, and they're like screwed into the plaster on the wall in front of the ladies' room and the men's room, and and um, and it's just maddening to see like who would come all the way out to Queen. We're not, I mean, we're almost Nassau County, so who would come all the way out there, hang up two incorrect signs, don't make any sense for our organization. I was told that they were there to hang up signs for, they were the comfort station signs, which I have none on my site. And I know it's sort of a, a, a in the weeds type of detail, but wanted to share how, how this can happen. If there were good communication, this would not be happening. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so one of the suggestions I raised was the houses to be represented on HHT's board. Are the organization supportive of that? No, you have a representative to sit on the board. Good afternoon again, I'm Kelsey Bro at King Manor Museum in Jamaica. Um, we do not have a seat on the board and we have um, asked to see some of their board meeting minutes um, just so we can see really what decisions are made by the board, because as was iterated previously, we are um, not particularly sure who is accountable for what at the Historic House Trust or to whom. Um, for example, there used to be a curatorial position at the Historic House Trust, and they have a collections committee, which we recently found out about on some of our um, COVID-inspired bi-weekly phone calls. And, um, this committee makes decisions about what curatorial needs we have in our houses. I, and I've iterated this. I, I don't understand how that committee can make that decision if none of the houses are on that committee. And there used to be someone, and there used to be someone prior to that, who liaised with the houses a little bit. Um, but really, it was kind of like, are you having any problems? Maybe I can assist you. Um, in our expired license agreements, it says the Historic House Trust is supposed to provide us with data loggers. This is a little technical. Um, to, to track our temperature and humidity of our rooms for the safety of our collections. We don't have those in most of our sites. Um, this curatorial person was really there to sort of, in case you had any problems, 
Um, I have a very strong curatorial background. Often, um, both of the people who have been in this position while I've been at different historic house trust sites have asked me for advice, which isn't to like pat myself on the back, but really to say that the expertise lies with all of us. And also if this agency is supposed to advocate for us and provide expertise for us, uh, they really don't have a very strong mechanism of understanding what sort of expertise and advice we need. And you know, for some of the houses, some of these efforts may be more useful than others. We all understand that at 23 sites, there are 23 plus different needs and that not everything the Historic House Trust do does is going to be relevant to all of our sites. However, the fact that we don't have any formal voice in what they do, and many times there are initiatives that come, in fact, all of the initiatives really seem to come top down and as a surprise, and sometimes um, are duplicative of the work that we are already doing. For example, there was um, a small initiative that didn't happen because of the COVID pandemic about women's history for the centennial of women's suffrage that was sort of um, just dropped in, in, like, hey, we're doing this. Can you provide us the, the resources, the research about the women at your site? We're going to create some sort of thing. Uh, most of us already do that for our own site. We didn't need this sort of initiative. Um, and also, if it was meant to celebrate the women's suffrage centennial, we have all been planning our celebrations for this many years ago. So this was not substantive, and it was duplicative of our own work and was not something that we had asked for nor desired. Uh, and this is not to say anything about any of the individuals who are in any of the positions. I think all of us are um, happy to speak to that maybe individually, but it's more, we wanna iterate that this is not about the person who is in the curatorial spot, perhaps not having the expertise that they showed, that's not the issue. The issue is that we don't have a say in what type of help we're getting and that just, it seems a, a bit backwards to us. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, many, many of the nonprofits uh, who want these homes are cultural organizations uh, who receive funding from other city agencies, including DCLA. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Any one of you? Should I start? Okay. Sure. Hi, again. Uh, this is Jennifer Weprin, Walden Weprin from Queen's Farm, again. And um, I'll talk. I'm the largest organization of the historic houses. My operating budget pre COVID is around $3 million. We bring in over 400,000 visitors per year, again, pre COVID numbers, which is more than half of the annual visitation um, of the total sites in, in, combined. Um, and typically around 100,000, over 100,000 school children a year. So it takes a lot of money to do all that great work. Um, DCLA, for an example, gives me at, at yeah, obviously depending on the city budget, somewhere around 10% of my operating budget comes from Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, our local council person, Barry Gordenjek, is very generous, obviously supporting us. We're the only cultural organization in his district. So we'll get discretionary funding through him. Um, either through DYCD or Parks Equity um, and some of the, the cultural and, and you know, some of the other initiatives as well. And council members on this call, I'm so grateful for your support. Um, we get CASA funding and CII funding. So that's the city's piece of, of our funding. Um, other components come from my events. Um, I'm a free site 354 days per year. So most of those people coming through are not paying for anything. Um, and so how do we raise funds to be able to optimize the site create enrichment opportunities, connect with our communities, and that's sort of the work that we do. Did I answer that? Yeah. Okay. Did I answer that properly? I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, good. I, yeah. I wanted to add a little something. Um, just so, um, I think, oh, sorry, this is Melissa Brantman from the White Cop House. Um, one of our colleagues, Jessica Phillips, couldn't be here today, um, but um, I know that she's representative of Historic House Trust. I'm sorry, Historic Richmond Town. Um, and I'm not that familiar with the people at the Bronx Historical Society. Those are two organizations that are both CIGs, cultural institute groups within the Department of Cultural Affairs. As CIGs, um, I think there's now 34, since Weeksville's been added, 34 um, sites that get funding from the department directly to their operations to support their staff 
Um, I believe, I just wanted to double check, um, Historic Richmond Town gets 49% of their budget through the CIG funding, half of their budget through DCLA. And they get $2,500 because of the Historic House Trust. And I guess, you know, I mean, and we understood sort of how the funding from parks comes in. Um, while I understand that we do get things like funding um, from parks from that $400,000, often that funding is less helpful and more complicated. For instance, um, several of us sort of opted out of the uh, exterminator services this year because it was becoming so difficult with the communication because we can't talk directly to the exterminators. Mm -hmm. We have to go through one or two people within the historic house trust. They weren't showing up on days they were, you know, they were scheduled to. And obviously this isn't the, you know, historic house trust employees are working hard to try to remedy, remedy that, but it's always triangulating. I can't tell how many times I've had to call Derek, Danielle and John while standing there with the exterminator asking if he should go or not. So it's just sort of adding in, I mean, and, and they're working hard. They really are working and they're putting a lot of time in and it takes our time as well. And often these services just, you know, aren't, I hate to say it, aren't worth the hassle. Um, and um, so I just thought, you know, from, from the perspective of, of the funding, um, I also want to point out that we do get $2,500 in GOS from the parks, I mean, from the Historic House Trust, and we really appreciate it. That being said, it isn't without certain requirements. Um, there are requirements basically each year in order to get our GOS funding, we have to make sure that we've submitted all the documentation in our license agreements. My particular sites, uh, my particular site, our license agreement dates to 1977. So obviously those, we're a unique case. A lot of them are on a standard agreement. And I have been told by the Historic House Trust that whether, you know, it might not be up to me, but we will, we will be necessarily put on that, that um, license agreement eventually. That being said, we always do provide the list of things like our 990, our audit, our, um, our board minutes, our, uh, our budgets, and our tax returns. Oh, also our um, monthly maintenance checklists and our attendance records. So these are all sort of the requirements. Now, they're not, we don't report on that GOS money, but we do have to provide that information up front. And, and that being said, we would certainly provide that information, um, whether it was a requirement in our license agreement or not, but it's sort of being stipulated on whether we get our $2,500. It leaves a bad taste in our mouth. And I think I, I've articulated that. It feels really a lot like kids getting their allowance if they do their chores. Um, like we mentioned, we are professionals. You know, we care deeply about these houses. Several of us have spent the majority of our lives, if not careers, um, championing, championing, championing these houses and um, really moving them into the 21st century to become places of, um, you know, where, where we're really, you know, where there's many of us work on issues that are near and dear to our hearts and social justice oriented through the lens of history and our sites. Um, and I think sort of, the way that we feel sort of have to, that we what we have to kind of our role is really just to report back and stay within the parameters of a license agreement which could be a whole other conversation um, that really doesn't necessarily benefit us um, and uh, I do know that as John mentioned they are planning on doing sort of a revisiting of that we're in the process right now of negotiating our caretaker agreements um, and and I certainly understand it is a very long arduous process, um, but we're really here to make sure that, that we're able to, um, we're able to keep these sites alive and we, you know, and we certainly together have the expertise uh, to do so. so. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And this is just Victoria Monroe, very quickly, um, to add to all of that, um, what has, uh, is another layer is that access to certain funding is blocked to us as historic houses because of our current uh, relationship or contract with HHT and parks. So we are not allowed to apply for certain discretionary funding to update things like our computer software and telephone systems. And there actually was an award made to the Morris Jumel and they have not been allowed to access that money. So um, 
often there is a conflict to us even moving forward with successful grant uh, applications because of the nature of our relationship and the uh, problematics with um, contracting out or using any kind of capital monies. Can you clarify that's DCLA? That was DCLA capital because DCLA was part of uh, you know, your question. And of course, every year we have no security on how much DCLA funding we will receive at each of our sites and renew our requests for our CASA programs, cultural immigration, theatres of colour, which at our own individual sites, of course, we write, produce and do everything for those programs. They're not a complete program that's given to us. We sculpt them in alignment with our own missions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chris, do, do, do we have other council members who, uh, who want to ask questions? Yes, council member Holden does have a question. Does have questions. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Ku, and thank you, panel. I mean, uh, some of the, uh, the testimony uh, uh, that I'm hearing, it, we're, it sounds like a deep frustration here with, uh, and this is what I'm, uh, I'm afraid of with, when you have parks personnel, people who work for parks, part of any trust or, or uh, overseeing uh, uh, organization like the Historic House Trust. This is what I'm afraid of, adding more bureaucracy and making your lives miserable or more frustrated. Nobody knows your houses like you, like the, like the panel that we just heard, nobody. And I hate the fact that we have bureaucrats dictating what should be done when you know best and then don't offer any communication or very little. And just that $2,500, which is really a stipend that you have to earn it with paperwork. Um, and many of you, and what I just heard was that sometimes it's not worth it. The fact that you have all these strings attached. So I, I what I would like from this panel, and this is uh, personal, I'm not speaking for the committee or the chair, but I'd like recommendations for possible legislation which is my job, by the way, our jobs as council members to come up and correct situations and correct problems like this. Because um, you, you're responsible for your houses, yet it only goes a certain way. You know, it, go, it looks like it's a one way street. So we need more input. We need more communications with the Historic House Trust. That's what I heard. Uh, and we need solutions. So the fact that, uh, that the Parks Committee hasn't had uh, you know, we should have regular hearings on this and not once every 15 years. So um, I, I thank you all for your, your testimony and um, for all your hard work, because it is frustrating when somebody tries to dictate, um, especially the city uh, takes, takes, a, takes it away from you and says, this is what's going to happen, or we're gonna show up unannounced and put up signs. Um, it's frustrating because th this is, these are really, you are, you are just so committed to the houses, what I've, what I've seen, that it really needs to have more communication with not only parks, but the historic house trust. So we need, the morale is, I, I see is, would you say, uh, you know, anybody can answer this, but, you know, how is the morale at the, at the houses, what I've heard, but are you in, like, uh, are you thinking about, um, just resigning because you can't you can't take this anymore. Uh, you know, are you thinking about giving up? Does this drain you to the point that you just had enough? Hi, I'm Kim Mayer. I'm the executive director of the Old Stone House in Brooklyn, and I've been with the house for 16 years. I think uh, what you see here today is really the tremendous growth of these organizations and our passion for the work that we do. I don't think that anybody is interested in resigning out of frustration. I think our goal is to find a path forward to be able to work more effectively with parks and the city. And this is a great opportunity and a great start and to be given a charge of suggestions for legislation is uh, gratifying for us and we appreciate that very much. Uh, I don't think that any of the houses would have come to the place that they are without the foundation of the trust. 
but things evolve and times change and organizations grow. And so to be able to look at this critically and think about how we move forward is essential at this point in time. Thank you very much. Thank you, anybody else? Okay, so nobody's resigning, good. <laughs> all right, we're, we're all gonna stay with it. Yeah, that um, being said, you know, there are people not in the room for a reason. <laughs> all right, all right, so. <laughs> So at least thank you. Today. Thank you, Council Member. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you, all the directors, for your passion and your dedication. Yeah. So my last question is, my understanding is there are concerns about safety. Can someone speak to that? I don't want to read safety. Yeah. Um, okay, Kelsey, uh, we're going to read a statement by one of the directors that isn't able to be here because of a conflict on the topic. This is Kelsey Burrow once again from King Manor Museum. Um, I'm reading a statement from Meredith Horsford at the Dyckman Farmhouse Museum in Upper Manhattan. The reason why I wanted to read her statements and she couldn't be here today is because she has some very serious security concerns. And some of you may be uh, cognizant of a shooting that happened in King Park that was about two yards away from King Manor Museum just a few weeks ago. And police officers asked my staff, I wasn't present, I was at a meeting elsewhere. Um, if we had security cameras, because they would have liked to be able to use our footage to identify the perpetrator who has not yet been caught. Um, we do not have security cameras um, for this 250 year old site. Um, just let that be. So I would like to read this statement from Meredith. I think you'll find it enlightening and thank you for your patience in letting me read the testimony of somebody who couldn't make it all the way to Staten Island today. So again, this is from Meredith Horsford at the Dyckman Farmhouse in Upper Manhattan. So Dykeman Farmhouse has 15 benches outside of the property along the sidewalk. Five of them are along 204th Street, which is dimly lit and home to a group of drug dealers day and night. Those drug dealers watch the comings and goings of the museum staff, a staff of three women, one of whom is often there alone. And they store drugs on the property and weapons in the sidewalk tree pits. People also climb onto these benches and over the low fence to break onto the property. The staff has come to work in the morning to find someone passed out in the park with a needle in their arm. Two summers ago, the museum was broken into twice. The security alarm alerts parks when it's tripped, and in both instances, parks did not call the police. So staff could have walked onto an active crime scene. One of the museum windows is still boarded up from a break-in in July of 2019. Meredith has been advocating for cameras and lighting and to have those benches along 204th Street that facilitate climbing over her fence removed for several years to no avail. Along Broadway, there are 10 benches, several of which are used by regulars to openly drink alcohol and do drugs all day. They have threatened the Dykeman's Farmhouses Museum volunteers and exposed themselves to the staff. And that museum is diagonally across the street from a school. Finally, Meredith has expressed to the Parks Department the New York Police Department and to many other facets of city government that she feels very unsafe at work and would like to make it home safely to their families, but nobody seems willing to do anything about it. She says, and I quote, I also received complaints from people living in neighboring apartment buildings about their safety concerns, and I have to explain to them that we too want safety for the community, but we haven't been able to get anyone to help. Thank you for listening to Meredith's statement. Thank you. Anyone else? This is Victoria Munro once again from Ellis Austin House. I just want to um, make sure that it's clear that we pay for, um, out of our own general operating budget, our security system. Um, and that is the case for many of the houses. And we would dearly love uh, a camera system to be able to be set up, even a ring doorbell so that we could monitor who's coming to the door when we have one woman working here alone. Um, we had uh, just last weekend, our benches were graffitied. Um, we have also a very low picket fence and someone can just open our gates and wander into the parks. Plus we were delivered park signage uh, just in the past 12 months that said that our park was open until 1 a.m which it is not, it should be closing at dusk. And we've had no adjustment to that signage. That signage is applicable to the beach in front of the house, not our actual park. 
Um, so security cameras would be ideal. As John said, we often maintain our own security systems because we own our collections, um, which we do, of course, here. But uh, we value uh, the security of the outdoor of the house. We don't want to see our homes graffitied. We don't want to see this park's property graffitied and any other security issues that help protect our park going communities. Thank you. Oh yes, and we've been obviously, <laughs> many of us would fund our own cameras uh, or apply for funding for cameras, but we've been told we cannot attach any cameras to the houses. Thank you. Yeah, we will address these issues to the trust and parks department, yeah. Uh, do, do you do any of you have uh, more uh, suggestions or complaints or all the we answer I mean we you bring up all the issues right yeah um, any more um, so uh, I, I, I guess this is Melissa real quick. sorry real quick, I'll be pretty quick this is Melissa from the White House House so I think one of the overall you know, I appreciate um, Councilmember Koo and Councilmember Holdings um, just, you know, asking us what is it that we'd like to see. And certainly I think we we are almost like taken aback by the question and I'm excited by the opportunity. Um, and I hope we have some, we have the opportunity to work on um, developing solutions together with the Parks Department, Historic House Trust and you. Um, I think one of the overriding themes we kept finding as we were talking was really being able to represent ourselves, um, advocate for ourselves and leverage our own resources and expertise. Um, you know, this, this hearing came on pretty quickly and we, we, um, we did have a meeting with HHT who gave us an overview, but we did organize relatively, relatively nimbly and fast within less than a week to put together a statement. And in doing so, we started to realize um, where our, where our um, our challenges overlapped, and also um, how many resources we have amongst ourselves. So, um, being able to sort of grow into ourselves and continue to 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 be supported is is really um, we hope the path forward. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all of you coming to testify. No. I want to thank each one of you for your dedication, your passion, and in preserving history for the city of New York. Uh, we look forward to work with you, and we will cooperate with you. Uh, please let us know anything we can do. Uh, so I think uh, we finished all the questions with all of you. Uh, Chris, are there any other public participations? Yes, Council Member, there are two more people who are registered to speak as of now. Um, and uh, the next person is Maria uh, Beche, and I apologize if I mispronounced that, but she is up next and she'll be followed by Maria Carrasco. Thank you. Uh, Chair Ku, I am Maria Beche. I bring a new perspective uh, to the subject at hand today as a relatively new trustee of the Queen's Historical Society. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today about the Queen's Historical Society based at Kingsland Homestead in Flushing, Queens at Weeping Beach Park. We are heavily reliant on the Parks Department. Queen's Historical Society is the only Historical Society impacting all of the borough's 15 districts. The society documents, pre preserves, and presents the borough's history through exhibitions, community outreach programs, and various volunteer opportunities. We respectfully request your consideration of the following matters. Improve the efficiency of the capital budget process between Parks Department and Historic House Museums. More transparency in the capital budget funds allocation process. Kingsland Homestead has been located for over 50 years on the premises of the historic Weeping Beach Park. The Weeping Beach 
tree that once rooted itself in this park lived for 151 years from 1847 to 1998, one of the city's few trees to be landmarked. The weeping beech tree and its descendants represent the focal point of the park's integrity. Capital funding requests include restoration of the unique decorative metal gate. The park surrounding metal gate has not been repainted or replaced in over three decades. Driveway. The museum's driveway remains to be a constant concern. We respectfully request additional funds to be allocated for an appropriate and functional paved entrance driveway. Forestry. Timely and consistent maintenance of the historic weeping beech tree. Expense budget requests. Queens Historical Society has successfully implemented free and in some cases very nominally charged online events for families, seniors and public school students. We ask that the committee please consider additional operating budget allocations for our educational and community outreach programs offered in Mandarin Chinese, Spanish, Korean, and English. In closing, Queens Historical Society aims to build upon and enhance the goals and aspirations of Historic House Trust through greater transparency and clearly defined methods of procurement. Kingsland Homestead is an historic gem located in the robust immigrant community of Flushing, Queens. Now, more than ever, clear and focused leadership collectively advocating for sufficient financial stability preventative maintenance and general upkeep of historic houses and public green space is crucial for the preservation of historic homes in New York City. Chair Ku and Director Krawcheck, please, let's provide improved communications and efficient and effective systems to all the dedicated people who preserve the history of New York City. Thank you very much for letting me speak today. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll next hear from Maria Carrasco. Thank you, uh, Chair Ku and all committee members. I am Maria Carrasco, Vice President of Public Programs with Prospect Park Alliance, the nonprofit organization that operates Prospect Park in partnership with the city, as well as Lefferts Historic House, also located in Prospect Park in partnership with the Historic House Trust. Lefferts Historic House Museum is an 18th century farmhouse that features a working garden, historic artifacts, period rooms, and interactive exhibits. Located in Prospect Park and nestled between the carousel and zoo, the museum welcomes over 30,000 visitors a year with families and young children representing a large part of our audience. At the museum, Prospect Park Alliance sheds light on the rich history of Brooklyn and the lives of the people that lived and worked on the land, including the Lenape, Dutch and enslaved Africans. Visitors explore history through hands-on experiences, imaginative play, cultural performances, and also gather to celebrate the diversity of our community today. In addition to our seasonal programs, which take, a, take place April through December, the Alliance also partners with many community organizations to present free cultural programs based on uh, free cultural programs. In the past several years, this has included We Are Brooklyn, Immigrant Voices, a multimedia exhibition based on immigrant oral histories from the Brooklyn College Listening Project, Nothing About Us, an exploration of educational segregation written and performed 
by New York City public uh, high school students through the support of New York Appleseed, Live Here, Learn Here, and the Epic Theater Ensemble. The Brooklyn Roots Festival, a day of performances and workshops by the borough's many diverse cultural and ethnic groups presented in partnership with the Brooklyn Arts Council and Caribbean Prospect Park, an exhibit and program series celebrating Caribbean American Awareness Month. When faced with the COVID-19 pandemic, Prospect Park Alliance launched a virtual Prospect Park website portal filled with activities, online programs, and self-guided tours that park lovers could enjoy from the comfort of their home. To date, this portal has received more than 22,000 views. When the restrictions began to be lifted, we quickly pivoted our program back to the park, but in a safe and socially distant manner with the launch of pop-up Leffert's Play and Go Kits. This program was developed as a mobile education station where families and children were given the opportunity to explore the leisure time activities of the Lenape, Dutch, and enslaved Africans. Participants were also given kits that had materials and instructions to make a few historic games at home. The Alliance popped up in locations throughout the park, as well as Jackie Robinson Park in Bedford-Stuyvesant and the New Lots Library in East New York. The program served 1,519 visitors over the course of eight events who, uh, with, with families and children barring 2,500 games and activities. Prospect Park Alliance is incredibly grateful to have received 2.5 million in funding from former speaker Melissa Mark Viverito and the Brooklyn delegation of the New York City Council to restore Leffert's historic house. This funding is critical to stabilizing the house to ensure it is able to serve families for many decades to come. The restoration will enable the Alliance to replace the roof and restore the exterior, which have significantly deteriorated over time. The house was slated to kick off construction in the spring when construction was halted citywide. Unfortunately, when restrict restrictions were lifted, the city did not release the funds so that work can start on the project. We are asking for the city council's support in lobbying for the release of these funds with the Office of Management and Budget so that work can start on this project before the, the house falls into further and more severe disrepair. In conjunction with the restoration, the Alliance will re-envision the programming and mission of the museum, rethinking the purpose of a historic house museum and how it can shed light on the experiences of our ancestors but also serve as a community hub and a space for dialogue in today's Brooklyn. We look forward to partnering with our local electeds, community partners, and house museum scholars on this work in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. At this point, uh, if we have inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify today and has yet to have been called, Please use the Zoom hand raise function and you'll be called on uh, in the order that your hand has been raised. Seeing no one else at this point, I will then turn it over to Chair Ku to offer some closing remarks. Oh, I see Council Member Holden does have a question. Time starts now. I just have a, a statement. I just want to know if, uh, or a question is, is the Parks uh, Assistant Commissioner Biederman still on the hearing? Because I, I didn't see him. Is, could, Sergeant? Uh, okay. No. The, the commissioner has left the Parks Department is no longer at the hearing. Yeah, because I think it's a kind of a shame. I know that one person from Parks, uh, Matt Drury's on, I think. Um, but it would have been nice to see the Parks uh, Assistant Commissioner stay on the hearing at least to hear from the directors of the historic houses, their testimony, since we haven't had a uh, hearing uh, in 15 years. So I, I just think that, that he could have stayed on to listen. And I hope he looks at the, uh, the tape of this because it's important testimony that he must hear. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, uh, Committee Council, for the great hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Holden. And at this, uh, Council Member Holden, at this point, I'll turn back to Chair Ku to offer some closing remarks and adjourn the hearing. Thank you, Chris. Uh, 
it has been a very fruitful uh, public hearing. We learned a lot, and I hope the past department uh, will uh, listen to the complaints and suggestions and do improvements uh, as soon as possible. And uh, communication is really important. So I want to thank the past department and of course the our committee uh, chair, uh, our committee uh, council, Chris and Patrick and Chima and Monica for doing a lot of work back uh, in the background and also my chief of staff, uh, Elaine Chong. So everyone have a good day. Thank you. The meeting is now adjourned.